Alright, here we go. Um, new thing for us, an evening with our friends of the UK Pirate Party. With us tonight we have the leader of um, PPUK, which is um, Los K. And um, first, of, first of all, I'll ask him to present himself and the party um, a bit so that we have an introduction. Sure, um, my name's Loz, I'm leader of Pirate Party UK. Um, I've been in this position for just over two years now. Um, we've had a pirate party um, really just going for just over three years in the United Kingdom. Uh, I think like many people in, um, in a number of countries, we were very inspired by the successes, um, I mean, particularly of the, the Swedish pirate party in the, Euro in the European Parliament election. I think for a lot of people that uh, felt, um, w had thought uh, in particular is issues like digital rights were very important and civil liberties, for they didn't have a place to go in, in British politics. And um, a pirate party seems the logical place to be. I think it's interesting for the debate and the discussion that we'll have today that it was very much the successes on the in the European Parliament elections that perhaps kick-started um, our interest in creating a pirate party. Um, so, so, so I'm here today, and also we have present um, Andy as AGO Houses is Nick and uh, who is our campaigns manager we're both based in the um, in the north of Britain um, recently we've had uh, more success in terms of uh, electorally um, we're beginning to we've our highest percentage is five percent of the vote Although, obviously, um, we have a rather different system um, electorally in the United Kingdom, which means it's more difficult for us to break through. But it's all, it's all the more important that, we're, that, we're, that we attempt to do so. Um, obviously, um, you, uh, the European politics has been a very um, uh, hot issue in both national politics and indeed for us in the Pirate Party at the beginning of this year. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how good is the implementation of the Pirate Party in UK? I mean, how many people do you have? Um, are you more like big city party, like I guess many pirate parties are internationally? Um, are you more present in the south and in, in, in the north? What about Scotland? How does it work? So for us, um, as we yes, we're very much. I think, like many, we're a party of the internet. We're still really at the beginning of our growth period. Um, we're set. I mean, we have just. I mean, I'm very few members compared to you, and we're just coming up to setting ourselves the target for a thousand members um, within the next a month or so. So it's a very different situation. Um, where we've particularly stood in elections has been in the north of Britain. I think that's been a lot to do with um, particular candidates and where we've had people who are able um, also to support candidates, but also in Scotland as well. Also for the Scottish parliamentary elections, which has a different, um, which has a different system. Um, so, so um, really, yes, our next target is looking forward to um, to 2014 obviously with the European elections and also local elections as well um, I see we have two people want to ask something we would have Alan first just really wanted to make a, a general statement about um England and Europe and Cameron and the importance of the Pirate Party, uh, but it, it's not really urgent. I'd, I'd, I'll make it later. Okay. All right. I defer. Okay, thank you. And, um, Funk, do you have anything that is on topic now? Yes, uh, you spoke, uh, Loske, about the, I think, the, the voting system, which is uh, difficult for you in, in the UK. And my question would be, um, because in the European Parliament election, I, th I guess you don't have this problem. Uh, is that an attractive uh, option for you to to go for the European election? 
Yes, obviously this is different, and it, I, and it gives us a real possibility. Um, but again, the, the, the other side of that is we will need to be able to build on large regions. Essentially, for the European Parliament elections, it's still voted for in regions in, the, in, um, in the United Kingdom. So, for example, where I live, it's northwest, which is a large region. But it, it, makes a diff- it's, it gives a different possibility for us. For the first time, a, a possibility to think about get, making a significant impression on the vote. Um, the particular challenges that we'll have is, um, is essentially fighting out the space perhaps between, between um, particularly with the Greens. And I think perhaps a lot of people still see us as fighting over the same political area. But I think that's also partly why we've wanted to profile ourselves slightly different on European politics as well. Um, uh, so it does give us a po- it does give us a possibility to break through absolutely. Andy, you wanted to answer as well. Yeah, I mean, just to give an overview for candidates in elections, we obviously stand local candidates, which are um, essentially covering very small areas, um, where we have to focus on individuals, and we also stand parliamentary candidates, where again it's representative democracy. We very much are looking at people as well as party. You have to have a credible candidate. The European elections will be the first time where we can give a very large number of people the opportunity to put a tick next to the pirate party. The issue that we have and the issue that we have to address is making sure that we still present credible candidates. If you look at the other parties that do well in European elections in the UK, they tend to have a couple of people who are very prominent um, and presenting the party as almost as an incarnation of the party and it's something that we have to emulate if we intend to do well right so you 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 count out a few um good faces let's say to to pull the the list yeah we need credibility in people and we need candidates who obviously are able to do the job should they be elected Sure, it's um, but it's um, very much. This is also perhaps the one area where, um, in terms of British politics, at least, where also the party perhaps weighs more. Um, otherwise, um, it is the reality that uh, that British pol- politics is very person focused. Um, so uh, again, it does give us the opportunity to. Um, to also present our ideas in a more broad sense. Um, and that's, I mean, after all, I think very few British people could probably name their, their, their members of European Parliament. Perhaps, um, perhaps ironically, the most famous one would be Nigel Farage, the, the leader of the UK Independence Party, who is um, very anti-EU. Um... But since you mentioned earlier that you managed a five-person score, was that a national election? Like, is it something you can expect to achieve at the EU um, 2014 election? I can um, go, Andy. Well, we've had some polling data recently. Um, what's interesting is that we poll quite well with young people. We have poor turnout in European elections. I mean, we have poor turnout in local elections as well and by-elections. But the Euros, we're going to see low turnout probably. The bulk of our support appears to be in the group of people who don't vote as much. So um, that's people under the age of 34 or so. Um, So, no, I don't think we can easily translate any of our election results directly. For example, the local election results with 5% is very much focused on an individual or individuals who are prominent and focused in their area working locally. That doesn't apply when you're talking about a region with several million people. Um, We will have to rely more on the Pirate Party brand, as it were. And we've got a year, basically, to very, very much solidify what that means in the terms of a European election in the United Kingdom. And you mentioned Scotland as well, but who's got a different system for their parliament. Um, How does that make your chances higher to get um, some delegates into uh, the Scottish parliament? Arguably, yes. Um, The issue is one of making sure we have the right people in Scotland. Um, I think, yeah, it does because it is a proportional system. 
um, it's just one that uh, we're going to have to make more effort in working on. We are lighter in Scotland than we are in the north of England, um, so it's a case of resources more than anything else there. Uh, Frank has something. Yes, uh, I have another question. I'm not sure if it was said or, or in Germany. It's the way that if you go for the German national election, you must win at least 5% of the votes to get into the parliament. And for us, uh, if we go for the European election, this 5% Uh, barrier does not exist. So even if we would only have four percent, we would have uh, we had uh, members in the European Parliament. And my question is: uh, Do you have this five percent barrier, or is there no barrier in in the UK regarding European election? Well, there's um, actually how it how it works out is a kind of there is. Um, there is no actual barrier, but essentially to be, um, I mean, I think Andy, you'll uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but actually what we need to be looking at is is above that 5% to be sure of actually getting in. It's rather, I mean, it's, again, it's rather more It depends um, who votes for which parties and which for which lists, um, but we have to be thinking in those terms. Yeah, my notes indicate that the lowest possible for anything will be around about 8%, but it's not um, mandated. I would point out that for national elections, obviously 5% gets you your deposit back, 50% or so will get you elected. Or 30. Um, talking about deposit, uh, how are the rules about, you know, um, do you have anything like public uh, party financing? No, um, we need to pay for it out of our own pocket we need five thousand pounds per region just to stand candidates um so at the moment we're looking at standing in three regions at least but it's going to be expensive and uh, yeah that's got to be financed by us our members and anybody else again which is why we're running membership drives and fine uh, and um fundraising thank you it's It's, uh, it is a matter of also a debate at the moment um, um, whether whether also a sim perhaps more similar system to what you have in Germany in terms of the fi uh, financing um, of uh, so parties uh, is going to come in. Um, I think it's very unlikely in the short term because generally there is a lot of feeling in the United Kingdom at the moment which is very anti-politicians anti and also anti-parties. I think it will be very difficult to move that through, particularly at the moment um, when um, the British political system is very, still very dominated by two big parties. Um, any talks about getting rid of the first past the post system? Well, we had a referendum um, on that um, actually two years ago now. Um, the, the it was very also a very disappointing, uh, also a very disappointing result and a very disappointing campaign. Frankly, we thought um, when. Uh, after the election in, tw uh, in 2010, when there was no overall one party controlling the British Parliament, this was the first realistic chance for some real democratic change. I mean, I was very much also um, part of also demonstrations at that time pressing for a real change. And this was one of the things that also the Liberal Democrats, perhaps closest maybe to the FDP in uh, in Germany, were hoping to deliver. Now, what it ended up being was a referendum on the alternative vote system, um, which fell. Uh, so, unfortunately, I think we're now very far away from a uh, real democratic change in the United Kingdom. Um, I'm actually sometimes embarrassed, frankly, for our country um, that we um, still have a horribly unrepresentative system. We're still ruled also in our second chamber by um, aristocracy and bishops. 
there are reserved places for bishops, which means there are actually reserved places for men. That can so those these are places that are only open to male. To, and so it's um, it's hugely frustrating at the moment, um, and it's very difficult to see um, where the change will come from in the next few years. But also, I think that's why we're important, I think, as a pirate party movement, because it feels like the mainstream parties have given up. I know that lots of people are very frustrated at, at the moment, particularly because um, in many areas, particularly the areas that I, uh, where I live and also I work politically in Manchester, um, in some areas, in the local elections, uh, fewer than 20% of people voted. Oh, so we're in real trouble here in the United Kingdom, democratic. Um, and I think um, so, that, so we have a big job to do. Um, our politics is horribly broken. But also, I'm hopeful that there are a lot of people that want to change. That's not going to happen overnight. But as a pirate party in the pirate party movement um, has given a place for some people to come where they feel they can't go anywhere, anywhere else and have a prospect of some real change. Hello, has something? Speaking of which, um you mentioned the frustration in, in the UK and, um, well, kind of animosities towards the EU. Um, your Prime Minister David Cameron uh, made some remarks um, which were commented by the, um, I think, Swedish Pirate Party um, representative in the European Parliament, Christian Engström, by posing an opportunity for reform of the EU. Um, what's your take on that and do you think that um, the the uh, referendum, the possible referendum on EU membership, uh, could pose a, um, um, an opportunity for for reform and for maybe also reforming the the uh, UK system. Well, very much so. Um, I, it's unusual for me to actually agree with something that David Cameron says, but um, I think the substance of that is right and I'm also glad other people um, in other countries and particularly Christian has, has seen that as an opportunity um, because and that's actually how we see it in, in Pirate Party UK. Um, perhaps a little background on that is that um, in our, pro in our uh, process of putting our policy platform together and manifesto which was a crowdsourced process that, that took us a year and thousands of people were involved in that also that we came to the that also the consensus was that actual real democratic reform and accountability was important in the European Union I think that's the way to see it I think um, and I think this is our opportunity and I think it's right that for example if we look at the European Commission I think we know from also, uh, issues that we care deeply about, things like ACTA or um, copyright reform, intellectual property reform, but it's been a huge frustration about particularly the attitude that the Commission has taken, that, um, that actually there's this been tendency to try and rubber stamp deals and fill committees full of um fill committees full of industry people um we, that's just one example about how it's important that we 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 seek some real um, reform and a cit and a real citizens europe that's what i'm interested in i think the problem about how David Cameron and the Conservative Party has gone about it. Um, and I mean, even worse, the UK Independence Party, is that it's framed in this way that's actually very hostile. And I think for a lot of people in different countries, and you know, we're all supposed to be friends and we are friends, I think 
it what how it comes across is hostile and unhelpful for instead of actually trying to say well how are we all going to get the kind of reform that we want and lots of countries want this it's not just people in the uk how do we get that it's phrased in this way that so often the conservative party talk about well brussels is deciding this as if somehow we're ruled by belgium and tintin and magritte it's ridiculous we have to take responsibility that we're all part of the eu project um so what I hope is that, that we can offer a different vision of that. So, yes, it's not all perfect. Far from it. There's lots of things that can and should and must be better. But that's but whether we will only get that if we work together. That won't happen if we're just um if we just come across as the united kingdom being a an angry little island <laughs> that's not going to work um so i think there's an opportunity but um i think it's frustrating yes i think it's frustrating that uh, particularly the conservative party i mean just how they've positioned themselves in the european parliament by removing themselves and associating them with also some um, kinds of politicians which i find um, actually very you know i think uh you know, have some very difficult views for me in terms of civil liberties that I think they've sidelined themselves. They're unlikely to get what they want. I hope that we can actually make a dialogue about saying there's a diff there is a real uh, possibility for change in the EU, and we shouldn't be afraid of referendums or asking what people think. But we need to work on it constructively and not by you know threats or insults. Um, Ellen. Yeah, I'd just like to reinforce what uh, Lawrence just said. I, I think the Pirate Party, I mean, I'm English living in Germany. Um, uh, what's important about the Pirate Party is their independent view of things and to be a voice that is not compromised by uh, party allegiances and corruption and intransparency. There's so many things that are going wrong in politics all over the place and the common principles that we have should uh, are just very important and it's not a matter of being pro-Europe or anti-Europe it's a matter of and I think Cameron was very good in most of his speech uh, is saying what we like about Europe and what we don't like about Europe and what we don't like about Europe as Cameron said, is a lot of what the things that the Pirate Party also doesn't like about Europe, the way things are undemocratically organized and just shunted through, and uh, democracy seems to be just a fig leaf for uh, industrial uh, mm, belligerence, basically, financial belligerence, just trying to bulldoze uh, uh, Europe into uh, uh, something I don't really like at all. Well, um, absolutely. Um, I think what also I try to do, for example, in my article for Public Service Europe is to also separate talking about how we might imagine the about European institutions functioning better from a nationalistic rhetoric and a nationalist way of talking about politics. The real danger, also particularly in the United Kingdom, is that somehow because it's been difficult for the big parties to discuss, um, because they'd rather not talk about difficult political issues, um, is that it's been left to populist right-wing parties. So the whole um, running in this area has been made by groups like UKIP, who actually, I think, frankly, as as far as I see, I see them xenophobic. I think, and I think they're clearly homophobic. I think so. I 
don't see them as um, a way forward for the, you know, the civil liberties of, of British citizens or of European citizens. Um, so I think it's important, it's time to say it's perfectly possible to discuss how we might do things better, we might, and also what we would want to do with the common agricultural policy, or what we would do about Strasbourg, uh, the commuting to Strasbourg, without it being somehow allied to, um, you know, uh, criticizing our friends um and i but i think that's really dangerous and it's not of course it's not just in the united kingdom it's also in the netherlands you know and it's also in denmark um perhaps most alarmingly perhaps in some of the developments in greece recently frank yes it, um, i have a question to uh, the english or british private party members here uh, which fits to what you just said um, and that's uh, when I read the the speech of David Cameron I was I was surprised because uh, he in uh, throughout the whole speech he spoke from a British national perspective and um, I mean, he's conservative and uh, I understand it, but I was still surprised because I, from my understanding, I, I, I assume that in, in, uh, UK it's similar than in Germany or other countries in, in Europe that m most people have not only a national identity, but also have, uh, to some extent already Uh, an idea that they are part of Europe and if Cameron only addresses this national perspective I have supposed that they felt uh, not understood fully and uh, my question is uh, how I mean you you live there you know it better uh, am I too optimistic if I assume that uh, British people also have this this uh, that they are able to share Uh, different identities, uh, or is that uh, really so um, so specialized that the the national identity people feeling is is so dominant as it comes uh, through uh, by the speech of David Cameron? I mean, I'll say what I think, and then perhaps Andy, if you want to also put in what your opinion of this is. Yeah. I um, I think um, the difficult yes, the difficulty is is that um, because um, in the United Kingdom that we haven't had a referendum on, for example, the Maastricht treaties or the Lisbon treaties, and also that we were promised one on the Lisbon treaty, which didn't happen. I think what's built up over, I mean, many years now, is a real resentment. And that's because there's been a feeling that the, the European Union project has changed, but there hasn't, but actually the views of the country at large have been ignored, or there hasn't been also a, a real democratic participation. Um, so that has built up resentment, which is then been also pushed by certain parts of our press. And I think particularly the British tabloid press, the kind of popular press, I think it's quite unusual in, in Europe, um, even now that, that uh, there's been very anti-Europe. Um, so both the EU and I think more generally to to you know, to everyone from Poles to Romanians and um, you know a great range of nationalities, but I think I think now that has been the danger of not bringing people along democratically, and I think it explains why Cameron has you, you wrote the, and gave the speech that he did because it's become very difficult now. Um, in the United Kingdom to even talk about European identity. I mean, I don't know what your take on it is, Andy. Well, to take a line from what I think was one of the German policy statements, from one of the German party's policy statements, which was Europapolitik is keine Außenpolitik, that, that European policy isn't 
um, foreign policy doesn't apply in the same way in the UK. European policy, to a certain extent, is still seen as foreign policy. We are looking at immigration as external people coming in, but with a different grade as when we're looking at outside of Europe. So whilst there is a a feeling, and it depends on age, I think to a large degree, and possibly socioeconomic factors as well, as to whether people consider themselves English, then British, then European, um, and how much weight they put on each of those things will depend heavily on the person. I don't think that the UK has swung anything like as close towards European integration as Germany has. If you look at things like the notion of a constitutional federal Europe, that isn't something that would go down very well with a very large number of people within the UK. Yes, um, a European Union that is about trade, that is about mobility of people, you know, it makes sense that there is an awful lot of crossover, an awful lot of political unity. But the UK is on the outside of the Eurozone. It has an independent financial, um, it has independent financial interests. It has independent uh, foreign policy interests in all sorts of senses, including defence. So I think there is a very different view in the UK when compared to Germany. Hello. Yeah, what would you say are the the, the reasons for this um, um, British exceptionalism? I don't think it's British exceptionalism. I think it's an I think it's an island nation culture. As somebody who spent most of their life in Germany and abroad, um, there is. A, I would say a fear of integration almost, um, but I don't think that that's fair entirely. I think there are different reasons for different groups. I think if you speak to people, again, under the age of 30 who've never been in a UK that wasn't part of the European Union, um, they see Europe as important. They can travel, they can work, they can sell uh, and buy from Europe. They can see what the benefits are. You start speaking to older people and it becomes more of an identity issue. We're losing our Britishness. I, I'm not saying that. That would be, you know, the sort of feeling um, that some people will have. And I, to be honest, I don't know where it comes from. Some of it will come from the press. There is an awful lot of angry feeling towards European diktats on sausage length and straight bananas. You know, that's from sort of 10, 15 years ago, which is simply not true. And Europe has played such a divisive part in British politics for such a long time that the political discourse tends to get mashed with that as well. It is changing. Um, I think one of the reasons that a European referendum is going to be a good thing is simply because it will allow all those of us who are interested in uh, being part of Europe and pursuing this project the opportunity to actually make the arguments that people don't hear. We often hear the European regulations argument. People don't tie that towards the regulations that they like in terms of uh, consumer protections, in terms of employment protections, which obviously have to be part of a common market. Um, so, yeah, I, that's, I can't give you a definitive answer, but that's where I'd go. Just as a counterpoint as well, though, I'd say that if you look at older people in Germany, I'm assuming, um, based on family and, and various other bits and pieces, that there is actually still quite a bit of resentment in some parts about European integration, whether it's about immigration or about money. Um, so I think it might be an idea to look at that from a German perspective as well and see if you're missing anything. Um, yeah, um... Well, I'll be the the odd one here in the in in, in the crowd because I'm I'm French, but um, I actually when I mean, people may be the German here can can uh, concur or uh, or not, but I'd rather say that the uh, older generation here uh, in Germany will tend to be even more European. Um, what you said about money is true; they're very attached to their money, but still, I uh, don't think. I mean, I have the comparison with France and. Um, Germany, even though they um, there was a lot of bad talk about the euro before it came, it um, I think was the country where it has been the most um, well welcome. There was the people were quite enthusiastic as 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 the euro came. Um, I can remember this quite clearly as I was in, in Germany as well. And um, because of, of of the history, because of the war, um, um, I think Germans are amongst the most Euro um, positive people we have on the continent. Yeah, I, can I just throw one thing in very quickly on that, which is also that I think the 
the various recessions have made it harder as well. I think when everything's going all right, um, you tend to have people being very positive about stuff. The moment you enter into a recession, it's very easy then suddenly to blame Europe rather than looking at what's actually happening. It becomes an easy scapegoat. I, I, anyway, there we are. I, Is it my turn now? Like yeah, hold yeah, on. Sorry. Jack, um, Jack, sorry to cut in. Um, if you want to talk, uh, there's um, a link here. Um, you can um, put your name on the list. Uh, starting line 17, we have Ellen now. I'd like to reinforce some of that. Uh, Germans don't have a problem with losing their identity. Uh, that plus of Second World War and lots of other things is not that important to them, and they love to be seen as European. But on the um, topic of money, then it is very different. I think you would have an 80% vote against bailing out Cyprus, Greece, Spain, whatever. They don't see that the money spent on bailing them out is basically uh, bailing out uh, German and French banks who lent these countries uh, far too much money and helped to build up in enormous bubbles. Uh, I see the main problem at the moment is not just between England and the rest is between the euro countries that is the 17 countries that have the common currency uh, the euro is driving a wedge between these 17 countries and the rest because for the euro to succeed there must be much closer integration financial integration common debt uh, mutual bonds things that the German electorate will not accept and but Merkel will have to accept it and I think she's realized she will have to accept it but will defer the decision to after the election because otherwise she will lose the election because the Germans will not stand for paying for Greece and all the idiocies of basically these countries but mainly also German and French banks and there's a wedge being being driven between the 17 of the euro uh, using countries and the and the others and I really think there's going to be uh, Cameron or not there's going to be a big big split up problem in Europe well if, if it's all right to come through on that also the final prospect. I mean, also, again, also men mentioning the Eurozone shows that also it's not just the United Kingdom that also perhaps takes some different views. I think it's really important to also move away from the idea that um, <laughs> that it's just the UK that has a problem and 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 every and uh, nobody else <laughs> or something like that. But also equally. Um, the how it was phrased, I think the reaction to uh, David Cameron's speech was also a lot of people said, "Well, there is no um, European à la carte." That is actually simply not the case. I mean, if we just look at the look at Denmark, for example, that also Denmark's not part of the eurozone, but also Denmark specifically um, had um, had a referendum mandate for some specific opt-outs. So, um, and also a further referendum in the year two thousand on on the euro. So. That's an example. I mean, I think in a way they've perhaps shown the way a bit better um, in that both they've been had actually the popul population citizens at, at, at large have been much more involved with the debate and also formed intelligently what they saw as the objections were. I think increasingly, as we're looking now, it's not just a year, EU of 27, but it will be of 28, and no doubt more, that we will not just see, I and mean, there's been talk about two-speed Europe, we will see a multi-speed Europe. But I think also as Pirate Party, I, I think um, certainly my view that it's right that as the United Kingdom, we're not part of the fiscal pact, because I think it's important that we have control more locally over our national budgets and you know on lots of levels I'd like that closer to people than even Westminster um, 
and I think this is a big problem in terms that we've seen in terms of the the euro zone and I think that needs to be something that's thought about again and I think this could become a difficult issue for us all actually um, if we if we're feeling that somehow so the um, monetary policy is being dictated that's certainly not something I kind of feel that I could live with um, particularly I think in, particularly thinking about some of the things that Alan said Jack, you're on? Uh, yeah, um, I'm another uh, UK Pirate Party member. Um, I just wanted to kind of, I guess, follow up on a bit of what Andy said about the whole um, diktats from Brussels and, um, you know, sort of bendy banana stuff, is that um, the way uh, legislation is kind of talked about over here is that it never gets really talked about when it's on the European level. It's only really talked about when it comes to transposing laws into uh, the British statute books. And as a result of this, it's partly to do with um, our politi other politicians and the media in that everything is seen to have come from Westminster except for when it's really bad, and in which case it comes from Brussels. And I think that's something that, that tends to add to the kind of Europhobia, is that the only times when we hear about laws coming from Brussels is generally when they're unpopular. And uh, when they're popular, people seem to think that they come from Westminster. Well, I can confirm that it's being done the same way everywhere, um, not only in, in, in the UK. I have a question on, um, um, you mentioned, um, Lawrence, you mentioned um, um, pro-EU sentiments um, in the UK. Um, how far does it go? I mean, first, um, was there any time in, in recent history, I mean, since the EU has, was created, um, when there was an overall good sentiment towards the EU creation, um, and second, uh, you have uh, you have the, the liberals that are well. We hear now and then that they are pro Europe. What does it mean to be pro Europe in the UK? I mean, they are the they are the uh, the only example we have. But how far do they go? I mean, what what is being pro Europe in the UK? Um, well, that's yes, two. Uh, Good um, questions. I mean, in terms of, um, uh, yes, well, first, in terms of when um, was it ever a, a popular thing, um, I think already um, the project ran into trouble um, popularly already um, towards the end of Mrs. Thatcher's time. Now, this is actually a long time ago. <laughs> um, but already a lot of us a lot of the beginning of the kind of the problems that still remain actually come from that time which is which is now decades ago um throughout the 90s it was a problem for the conservative party um and it split the conservative party deeply and in, in a way it, it was also it um led to uh, the fact that, that it was also one of the things that really contributed to the fact that um, the Labour Party was in power as long as it was. Um, so it, it was almost like um, both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party didn't want to talk about the issue too much because it, also, it brought up such big splits in their big parties. So that allowed a bad feeling to grow. Um, so and now, I think in particular, one of the one of the spectacular, I think the biggest spectacular failure is is the fact that there's never been any real recognition of the money that we pay out. And there's the famous image of is of Mrs. Thatcher's handbag and her wanting money back and the rebate. Um, is also that we have received so much. Um, again, the UK Independence Party is for, fond of talking about how much we pay, but 
aren't so quick to say what we receive. Uh, where I live, for example, has benefited hugely from the European Regional Development Fund. I cannot see how many of the projects, um, frankly, that have happened, that have benefited us so much, um, would also happen without the EU. That's been a sort of major thing, but also I think very few people actually have been actually uh, recognised that. What, and what is it to be pro-Europe? Well, I think uh, I think it's also got to a stage now. It's almost in terms of say the Liberal Democrats is that perhaps they're the ones that have also been saying, well, we just basically need to remain in the we, re we need to remain in the EU and not with too many opt outs I think that's as far as it goes now. Um, the, the electoral reality, and also that's something that we're facing, is to say, you know, as actually to talk about greater, uh, an ever greater union, I, I think people don't really want to hear that right now. Um, but the reality is also is that we just need to reimagine how it is that we work together and also i think i'd like to sort of throw that out to also to other uh, pirate parties is to is to say how do we imagine the, the sorts of things that we need to work together um, about because we can't not Fishing, for example, fish can't have tiny little passports, transport, trade, um, uh, radio spectrum, and of course, intellectual property. This has to happen on this level. We can't not talk to each other. But how do we do that in a way that really involves citizens? Um, you know, that would be my vision of what pro Europe is. Not necessarily, it's not necessarily being enthusiastic about the great big buildings in Brussels because I've been there and it feels very heavy. But also saying, actually saying, we have also particularly with technology, the internet, to create a an inclusive Europe as never before. And I think we can. You were cut out just now. Um. Oh. Yeah. Um, sorry, there we go. Um, I, I think we have the opportunity to create an inclusive Europe as never before, but also thinking about it in a very different way. And also that's what we do as a pirate party. You, um, Ellen. Yeah, uh, just to say some uh, positive things about Europe. Um, um, there seems to be in Brussels a core corruption. I mean, agriculture and financial things mustn't be touched. And uh, there, I don't think Brussels is terribly good. But they have been very useful in dealing with um, telecom companies and energy companies. Um, whereas on a national level, bribery and party donations uh, play a large role. Um, for just for example, the the roaming fees uh, that was uh, done in by Brussels and consumers all over Europe are very ha happy that Brussels was strong in that, and I think it should be the role of the Pirate Party to pursue transparency and to make sure that in the fields of agriculture and financial, uh, you know, the banks, and uh, that this. Uh, corruption and self-service mentality uh, are, um, that, are, that they are combated. But I do see, as I've said before, the 17 euro countries will have to be a lot closer together, and I don't think England is just one of the 10 others, that they will uh, accept, uh, accept that closer integration. So I see the euro um, as basically very, very divisive, and there's going to be big changes in the next year or two. Frank? Yes, I have another question. Um, I'm sort of, um, to give my background, uh, I feel very um, 
Oh, uh, how to say it? I would be. It would be. I would um, give it much value if if uh, UK would be part of of or would stay part of of Europe, uh, not only geographically but politically. And I'm looking for for ways to to under uh, to support this. And my question is. Um, when I read the speech of Cameron, I, I, I understood that um, he saw a, a strength in, in British foreign policy and that that is uh, something Britain could share with Europe. And uh, I think this is would be a good, I see a big potential there too, because for historic reasons, I my 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 opinion is that Germany is very weak uh, in formulating uh, foreign policy, and so it would be good uh, from a from a global perspective if if France and Britain takes the lead in this area. And this could be uh, uh, my question is if this couldn't if it's if you see that also that that could be something which brings. Uh, Europe together, including um, Britain. Yes. Well, it's interesting because also, I mean, in particularly, uh, it's also Catherine Ashton is um, in the Commission has responsible for a uh, responsibility for foreign policy, and I think it's been a bit surprising how uh, how anonymous she's been. And I think that's partly because it's difficult for her politically, um, given the current state of the debate in the United Kingdom itself. Um, again, I think this could be very difficult um, for the United Kingdom. We're still adjusting ourselves to the fact that we have to think about the world in a different way. Um, that uh, obviously that we now also need to think um, you know much more globally and equally to recognize the importance of Russia and India and China and the rest of it um, and I think we're still getting used to that um, it's it's partly that it was almost sometimes it feels like we've uh, we have difficulty um, letting go of our empire past but we have to um, we have to think internationally, but I think st still it's going to be difficult to get to involve the British people in the idea of a common European foreign policy. Um, but the reality is is that we need we are going to need to actually think about how we work together, Andy. Yeah, I mean, on the foreign policy aspect, um, it's really quite interesting for two reasons. Firstly, the UK is, if you look at the Foreign and Commonwealth is, it acts very independently. It's very stable given the way the civil service works in the UK and it pursues British interests in a huge sphere. Other countries broadly don't um, in the same way. The perception, of course, is that the UK, France, both post-imperial powers with their own issues that have caused lots of problems around the world that are continuing to come home to roost, um, might not be the best figureheads for a European combined foreign policy. Uh, lastly, in a practical sense, the UK doesn't work as closely with Europe as it does with, for example, the US, um, New Zealand, Australia, Canada. Uh, from a purely, purely practical intelligence cooperation, military cooperation and integration perspective, you will find that the British military has better ties with those countries than it has with European countries, even in the NATO context. So if you want to look at that, that's a good idea. Doing it from a European um, military perspective, whether that's a rapid reaction force or a proper military command structure to supplant NATO, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, and I think that's probably a huge problem for a bloc the size of the European, uh, well, besides the European Union, not to have as coherent um, 
the ability to protect its interests and to actually determine what its interests are abroad is a problem. We've seen that with Iran, we've seen that with Afghanistan, we see that with our interaction in lots of countries. So I'd be interested to hear what probably the German and French perspective on that is. Okay, that's uh, to reply on that. Uh, that brings in some realism in the discussion, I must admit, I assume. Uh, regarding uh, Catherine Ashton, uh, I want to remark that uh, I, f I would prefer it, uh, or I thought the idea that um, this this push position would be uh, given free to elections uh, I would prefer regarding um, um, how it is done so far and um, I could have imagined that someone like Tony Blair would have been uh, voted and um, that this would uh, could have been a possibility to to um, push this this uh, direction on the issue of Catherine Edgen I, I think that uh, she was deliberately chosen because she was, was a relative uh, lightweight and not, not very very well known um, maybe even on, on, on behalf of the, of the British um, to, to avoid any um, um, to, to avoid to, to uh, Put more weight than necessary on the common European foreign policy. Um, yeah, what uh, on what Andy said, um, it's true. The the military cooperation and military ties between uh, France and Germany, for instance, are much tighter than um, than with the uh, with the UK. That's true. But on the other hand, um, aren't there any bilateral military cooperations between France and um, uh, and Britain? I, I've heard of um, something like that in the context of the of the Mali conflict. Could could you comment? Libya, on that? Libya, yeah, Libya, Libya also. Yeah, there are bilateral agreements, but the point is that these are bilateral agreements from within European nation states rather than through the European Union. Um, I mean, we have a bilateral agreement with the French. I think we're going to share an aircraft carrier with our aeroplanes on it um, and various other bits and pieces. But the UK has a lot of bilateral relationships. And if you look at the importance of relationships, the five eyes, the, the UK, US, CAN, New Zealand, Australia, is absolutely preeminent. Then you've got NATO, you've got a whole range of other, sorry, you have a whole range of other agreements that come in there first almost. I mean the French one is a nice new change, we'll see where that goes, but it's not happening at the European level. If we want to see a European bloc with proper foreign policy and all the rest mm. of it, then that cooperation needs to be there. We have NATO, that obviously includes the US, so do we need something different on top of NATO, beside NATO? It gets messy quite quickly. I think as a pirate movement this is something we might want to look at, um, as strange as it sounds, simply because um, we do have common interests. We do have common um, uh, common interests and com common ideals that our foreign policy should probably address, and military aspect is part of that. But also, I, I think it's looking at the kind of the relationship to the United States. And I think this is something. I mean, a lot of us in very different contexts have been have been critical of and uh, whether it's to do with perhaps our core, there's a lot of our core issues is the feeling that uh, perhaps the, the pressure for things like ACTA has to come very much from the United States or whether, for, for example, looking at the kind of policy of, and, and the use of drones, um, I think um, I think I think we we are also a very important critical voice on that, um, and also in particular, it's it seems like a difficult position in the United Kingdom, where we have been so tied to the United States in a way that I find profoundly difficult, um, and has been profoundly disappointing frankly, for years now, and, and questioning. And again, I think that's something in the movement that we do, and that we should be doing, and we have been doing, whether it's to do with um, whistleblowing, information transparency, 
Um, so we need to be thinking, I think, on that that level, but also to find a kind of counterbalance to that relationship um, is going to be important. Um, is there anything? I mean, is, is there is there any talk? I mean, relevant talk about questioning that that relationship? Because I mean, it's it's um, it's been this doctrine has been around for ages that uh, well, the the UK has lost its empire, but um, now it's got the US. And the US is actually more powerful, but um, the UK has the brain more or less, and it can hope by be working very closely uh, with the US. Um, it can it can hope of somehow you know directing it, um, nudging it in the right direction. And as far as I can tell, um, it's not really working. And it's in I know there's been talks about it, like well, it's a nice idea, but it does, doesn't work out. How prominent is that? I mean, does anyone? Really talk about it, but recentering um, uh, the focus. Well, I think there it has been very much. I think from what you might call a classic left-wing perspective, that has been um, criticism of that. But that has also been very much, I think, trapped within a very particular way that that kind of politics is phrased. So it's it's been impossible to talk about wars without talking about oil, where whereas things have been rather more complicated than that. I think, in my view, um, it's yes. <sighs> I think it's very difficult to make the case, and and also that's why our position is very interesting right now, and I think that's why we're at an interesting point in our history because um, I think we still haven't quite accepted that perhaps we're not quite the big the big part of the world that the, that we perhaps once were, but it's where where we look now. But equally, obviously, for the United States, is that despite the famous special relationship um, that's talked that's talked about, obviously the United States is looking in different directions. It has to think about also its immediate sphere, um, the Americas in a very different way, and China, of course. Um, so I think. Um, we may well not be quite this, um, you know, I don't need a special relationship. I want a proper and respectful relationship. You know, that's, that. I think that's what we need to be thinking about. And, um, and again, this is something we can press for and also perhaps pressing for it from a different perspective is a good thing to be doing. Um, back to foreign policy, I think we have something that it would really a more or less split, um, at, at least ideologically, um, the unit because, um, well, the big players are obviously um, Britain and France, and um, the others, as far as I know, no one is meeting their um, defense spending requirements um, inside of NATO. So, um, yeah, this, this, there's a bad history for that. This is the precedents are not 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 looking good. Um, Germany, for historical reason, has been um, kept a low key approach, also called um, checkbook um, diplomacy. So I'm not I'm not too um, positive on the continent finding a common approach, even if it should find common goals, which is probably more likely, but as far as the approach is concerned, um, that's that's a tougher call. Um, maybe someone has some views on that. Well, I think just also to come up on some earlier points, even about perhaps, a, a, you know, elected roles, um, I think... I think what I'm really glad to hear is that that's certainly... Um, at least in the direction of what we've been talking about in terms of the Pirate Party UK policy, is very much about making the whole, also the, the European Union institutions um, more accountable. Also, it's the the focus being on directly re 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 and, uh, re elected representatives, but also um, taking much greater weight in terms of citizens participation i think that has to be where 
the pressure will come from. Um, and after all, again, uh, looking at it um, again in, in terms of the core of the things that we care about, that is why, at the end of the day, that uh, that the, we had the success with Actor that we did. But we can't fight that kind of battle each time. Um, that will get increasingly difficult. Um, but also thinking about that, on so I I think you know that's something perhaps I I can hope that we can offer um, to 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 other pirate parties and say look at least ask these questions of your politicians and and also in your elections and also your policy I'm not telling you what it should be that your members will decide that of course but at least start to pose the question about can we do this better should we be better should we be better represented and I'm glad it's not just us saying that that's why I'm frustrated by the language coming out of British politicians because it's a bit like uh, we're just saying we want stuff um, what I'm interested in is how do we work together to actually get the kind of Europe that we really want that will be able to deliver the kind of foreign policy that we're talking about that will be able to kind of prepare for the real the challenges that are up ahead um, and not just be arguing about oh well should we have this this individual power or that it's it's what how do we get people involved that will actually really um, have uh, change people's thinking um does anyone has a further point on foreign policy i have one very brief one if no one minds um which is essentially that there are there are challenges within Europe that are currently being tackled as foreign policy issues in the UK and I'd be interested to, to hear how or if those issues are being looked at in the same way from the German perspective. The one that springs to mind initially is Cyprus and partitioning which obviously um, is an international issue as such. You've got UN troops on the ground and so on and so forth but I've never really seen it looked at as a European issue when realistically it probably should be to some degree um, I just wonder if anybody had any thoughts on that because it's a concrete issue um, within or on the edges of, of Europe full stop and it's not something that we see very much about um, I think it's more of a NATO issue to be honest because the, the, the two powers involved are or two countries involved are Greece and uh, Turkey both NATO um, states so um, I think that must or should be discussed more in a, in a NATO context than in a European context. Um, okay, interesting. Un unless, unless you want to talk also about Turkey accession to the European Union, and I think, well, for us, that's uh, not an issue at the moment, I think. Okay. I can't say I've heard much about it either. Um, I'll be handing over the uh, central moderation to Flo for a few minutes. I put my kids to bed and I'll be right back. Ah, okay. We have Andy uh, still. Do you want to say something on uh, UK and the Euro still? Yeah, I um, essentially the whole European um, currency aspect. I think the I know Lars has covered a certain extent of it with what he was talking about with Denmark in particular, but the history of it is important. Um, the whole Black Wednesday disaster for the UK I think sets a lot of the tone for the UK in terms of um, Euro membership and I think we probably need to look at that as the basis for why the UK is quite so anti um, the Euro full stop and membership of the Euro which again I think sets us somewhat apart from other European parties in terms of being able to support well not even being able to support that our membership likely does not support um, Euro membership uh, and um, yeah, essentially, that there is an awful lot of history there. Uh, you're talking back to the 80s and, and 90s, that has to be overcome if we want to look at anything in terms of financial regulation and um, fiscal and monetary policy across the EU, which is something that obviously the core Euro members are key to discuss. And the UK had a bit of a fallout about earlier this, sorry, earlier uh, last year now. Um, and I think that again, in terms of policy, 
I don't know if there's a lot of crossover, but it'd be interesting to see if there is any um, crossover between pirate parties within Europe um, on this and how the feeling is in Germany especially, but also France and other European countries, in whether they still have domestic control over their currencies and economies. Anyone wants to answer or should I go? Yeah, I think you start and maybe I, I join in. Then me too. Then start, Alan. <laughs> yeah, go, go ahead, Alan. Oh, um, I thought uh, uh, Frank. Want, uh, I thought Frank wanted to speak first. No, on. I'm just reading in Wikipedia Black Wednesday. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, there's a saying in German: "By Geld freut hört die Freundschaft auf." I don't know how you translate that into English. Uh, when it comes down to money, friendship stops. And uh, every country has their own problems and situation, and it's going to be terribly, terribly difficult to do some organization. I think it's, there's a good chance that Brussels might have the ability to, to be strong, but uh, Likainen's things, my special topic is... Uh, um, the um, breaking up of the banks, in other words, into investment banks and uh, business banks. Uh, the proposals aren't strong enough, and I'm interested in what uh, Osborne is going to come up with. But that seems to be a, an absolutely essential fundament, fundament, or, or an essential fundamental decision that has to be made of how the banks are run, because they control the economy. Spain and Ireland were going very well as countries until their banks uh, misled, largely by foreign banks. German banks couldn't really lend profitably into the German economy, so they gave enormous amounts of money to Ireland and Spain, helping to fuel the terrible crises there. And I don't think there's going to be a happy end, I'm afraid. Yeah, to, to come back to uh, Andy's question, how do we feel or how do German people feel about about the Euro? I think um, when the Euro was introduced, um, people felt not very good about it because um, there's a, there was a significant pay rise, um, not pay rise, a uh, rise in, in, in staples, in, for instance. Prices. Yeah, and in prices, yeah, of course. Um, rise in prices and um, it was felt that we had made not that good a business deal of that. However, um, things changed I think. We're quite confident and, and quite happy with the with the currency but of course um, now the the take on on, on Europe and the the, uh, the attitude towards Europe the German people is more like we're the paymasters. We have to bail every, everyone out and, and, and uh, spend a lot of money for Europe. I met some some five or six years ago. I met with a with an American um, woman in, abroad somewhere, and she asked me um, some of almost the same question as as you did, and I answered that um, as long as the, the the German people do not feel the the um, Feel the pay rise, or no, feel that they um, have to pay more than they get back from from the European um, from the European Union. If they, sorry, now I lost the the thing. Damn it, um, <coughs> uh, Frank, you wanted to say something. I will come back to that point <laughs> if I. Uh, yes, no problem. Compose myself. <laughs> okay. Um, also, only a few comments. Um, I th my perception is that regarding the euro uh, in Germany, there's there's no clear 
position of the of the population there's rather insecurity um what what would be the right course it's not secure on the other hand i think uh, europe uh, founds uh, finds much um, much more support there's a, s a stable i just read an inquiry that about two thirds of the german population wants uh, that more issues are uh, are solved on the european level so uh, that's uh, currently going up because um in germany the situation people f the the living standards uh, are are developing really well so that's actually the problem we have in europe uh, in the eurozone is that in the south southern european countries uh, people suffer very much and um, in germany the situation gets better and better regarding unemployment and as long as that is in this way uh, german people um, are not really um, see the see the problem and it's from my point of view it's really an open issue uh, i don't know myself if if it uh, comes out well in the long run or not i i'm very i'm rather skeptical but i don't know it either and uh, going to um, the question uh, regarding the pirate party germany uh, is is there a, a position um there's no position regarding the euro we are not uh, we we tried that in different project groups to develop uh, own position but it's too uh, the the interest is not so big uh, it's not a main issue of the private party germany to discuss this matter um, i that's that's we found it out in liquid liquid uh, surveys the participation uh, participation in this uh, working in this yes. issues isn't very big um, there is one issue uh, where we found uh, uh, one issue uh, Alan mentioned that's uh, banking regulation there's a bigger uh, interest in this issue and uh, there's another issue which found uh, large support that's uh, also Uh, in the area of finance uh, the financial crisis so not so much the currency crisis but the financial crisis and uh, one solution uh, is in this area that we say the um, uh, the um, re recapitalization of big banks should be solved in the future without public money but with uh, taking Uh, under obligation not only the shareholders of these big banks but also the 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 owners of papers or, or the the creditors of these banks so we see this uh, financial problem that the 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 diff uh, the wrong uh, persons or the the taxpayers had to bail them out and there there's a different solution on the table it's called debt equity swap so that's an issue which uh, would gain a lot of support with private party germany but it's not it uh, was on the issue of the last um, uh, parteitag on the annual meeting but uh, it didn't come through because of the the there wasn't enough time so we haven't uh, voted it uh, final we haven't finalized it and the other thing uh, in this area is that um, also Uh, there's a paper saying we we must have in, in government debts there should be haircuts um, this is discussed and found a lot of support uh, but it is also not already a uh, uh, finalized position let the banks fail i quite agree <laughs> and how well i mean i think this is i think this is also something I think this actually it's why this is really good to have these discussions between all of us because I think this is something that I think we're all looking at and we've certainly had those questions in the United Kingdom as well um, that was one thing that we were talking about last year which is also the strict liability um, so that is absolutely taking also in terms of regulation is making sure 
But really, um, I think at the, the heart of everything that we're, we're talking about now is saying, how do we not end up in the same situation again as we did in 2008? Um, that's the big question, um, because obviously, if that that because the idea, if it's possible for the for to fail, and with there's the idea that oh well, actually that's all right, and we'll just barely add anyway. Well, of course that gives that opens the road to the same problems exactly again. I understand why, in terms of stability, you want to say well there has to be some guarantee of that, but also it's the question of how you get there. And I think that w what we've done is that we've. Um, What's been particularly worrying is that I think what we've seen in the United Kingdom is the sense that we've moved uh, some private failure to public debt. Um, and of course, that's not just the case for us, but also that's the challenge across um, across the continent too. So that's always the saying that we're, we're facing the same problems. Um, but also, I think if we, we, are, we are a voice to say, that we can't go down the same route again. Um, I think that's I, th um, I think that's a, a really useful thing that we can all be doing together. But if you maintain the nature of capitalism, you can't stop this from happening again. Sorry, no. we, we do have a I have got nothing list. to do with capitalism at all. Please, my answer to the problem with the banks. Um, I'm an absolute believer in free market economy, but it has to be controlled. Traditionally, banks were allowed to lend about 10 or 12 times the amount of deposits they had. And banks running the normal economy were very important, but they've been allowed to lever it to 50 times instead of 10 or 12 times. So they're lending far, far too much and they're allowed to speculate. They're being given money for free by the central banks, uh, so they're getting money for nothing. With this, they do a leverage of not even 50, but according to Asher Edelman, who's a very interesting man in America, uh, you can read about him on Google, they leverage 5,000 to 1 on money they're getting for nothing, speculating uh, at a rate of one to two or three thousand transactions per second per second not per minute making minimal computer organized uh, gains it is absolutely obscene that this is allowed to happen the banks have to be split up investment banks can be important but they should be run as partnerships as they used to to do in other words the partners uh, the owners um, uh, are responsible for the capital and if they go bust, they go bust and it's their own private money. And high street banks lending to companies, to firms for investment, creating, uh, uh, creating jobs, uh, supporting companies and small companies and startups like banks used to be 20, 30 years ago, they're very important, but they have to be split up and totally not this ring fencing that everybody's talking about. That's not a solution. They have to be split up, just as Glass Steagall did in 1932. And that is the A and O of everything financial. Indeed. Hey. And Sorry, gone. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. Basically, by the sounds of that discussion, it sounds like uh, financial, uh, mark, well, the ration of the markets and the financial industry is something that we should be talking about together within Europe, within the pirate parties. It sounds like it's sufficiently divorced from the monetary policy in the euro that we might, um, it might be an idea for us to work together on that. I know that for us in the in the European elections, it's going to be a major issue. So it would be good, um, I think, to work together, see what everybody else is coming up with, and uh, and see if we can come up with something that's sane, sensible, and works for a variety of of pirate parties across Europe, especially since I hope we all have roughly the same ideals in these areas. By all means, sir. Me too. Put me a part of that yes, discussion I, group. I understand. I um, 
I agree too. Great. Then we have our first um, international European working group on international finance. Well, we we already well we have a pretty mo pretty opinionated working group in part party of Germany called Geldordnung, mon money order Geldordnung. Of course, they you know they they called all sorts of names in a der derogative uh, way of uh, calling them. But the thing is, we are you know sort of hard thinking and um, you know no holds barred uh, talking about. Uh, monetary order, monetary regulation, you know, avoiding captured regulators and, and all that sorts of problems. And, you know, we do have an active working group there, the Geldordnung, uh, the money order working group. And these people are definitely not brainwashed like many people are who are, you know, being churned out by the uh, capitalist academic, uh, uh, you know, who everybody who's being a master of business administration, you know, so freaking to totally brainwashed capitalist, and we don't do that kind of business in the uh, money order, in the Geldordnung working group okay, in uh, part, part Germany. Thank you. Thank you. For I that. beg to disagree. Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, but uh, Frank is next on the, on the agenda. Okay, um, I would like to uh, speak about another topic um, that's in line 25 of this uh, pad uh, flow has developed but I can uh, explain it again and that is we have in term uh, private party has a, a program uh, in part of its program for uh, about Europe and uh, we have uh, done a translation and I would suggest maybe flow that you uh, posted or uh, that we um, presented now to the to our British Pirate Party friends, and uh, I would be very interested uh, what you think about it. If if you see, I have uh, an idea where there could be a problem, but uh, still, I would like to get your feedback on it. You mean the peer pro Europe? No, I mean the. Um, Thomas had um, put it on the on the mailing list, the translation of the Grundsatzprogramm. Yeah, you can see it in line 30. Yeah, I've, I've read this one. I don't know if anybody else has yet. I have. Can you maybe post a link to that? As I mean, I can give you a brief... I, I don't know if you were... When I was talking about it earlier on, about um, the UK approach to it, the, the two things that kind of stood out... In fact, I think this is where the um, European policy isn't foreign. Yeah, European policy is not foreign policy. Foreign policy. Comes from. Um, the issues that we would have from the UK side is the the level of unification, I think, um, and the constitutional basis for it. Both huge hot topic issues in the UK. Um, although, again, questions on the membership. There's a very big split even within the UK party in terms of the direction and level of cooperation. Um, everything from sticking to a a group of countries that want to trade together and have a common market right through to people who are far more keen to see something akin to a federal Europe as a state. Um, so it's it's interesting. I don't think the latter position is as popular in the UK as it might be elsewhere, but Jack will give you a good overview of that. Yeah, yeah um, I think it's... Well, it's definitely somewhere in between. I think there's a, a healthy attitude for um, some more integration, but I'm not exactly sure um, the extent of it. It's it's certainly more more towards more integration than the status quo, but I couldn't quantify that. What position do you exactly mean? Um, it's, it's hard to describe, I, I think, um, in that there are uh, a common issues that, um, that affect us all. And I think a lot of people would quite like common solutions, um, rather than it being all 27 
seem to be 28 members all coming up with their own solution done. Are you talking here about a red party position or a feeling in the general public in the UK? No, the, the pirate party position. Uh, PP International, PPEU, or you know, PPEU, you're talking about? No, PPUK. Oh, well, I mean, if, well, we're very clear after all about our, I mean, where the thrust of our, uh, where we're going in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the, the overall direction of of our EU uh, policy. Even though, I mean, it's it's quite uh, shortly um, delivered within kind of two uh, two. Um, pages of the manifesto and I think what it is is it goes back to the question of democratic accountability the heart of it and which is something that so is in our manifesto which was overwhelmingly adopted by the membership um, it, it talks about um, actually, which are, is a key princi principle for the European Union, which is uh, which is decisions being taken on the appropriate level, and um, with a uh, with appropriate um, with the appropriate um, accountability, really. And for some of those things, it, it may well be that, that also decision making needs to be moved closer. However. I mean, as we're aware, but uh, the fight needs to happen on all levels. I mean, particularly for us in the United Kingdom at the moment, so locally and in terms of Parliament and in terms of the European Union. Um, I think we've expressed that. Um, of course, there's no point in um, you, uh, to use uh, David Cameron one is repatriating powers from uh, the European Union to Westminster if people feel uh, just simply that actually they don't have any more democratic control over that than they did when they were, those powers happened to be in the European Union nothing's gained there and I think that's the case that we have to make but um, I think that's the key point it's not about individual issues it's not about whether um you want to take decisions about the european arrest warrant or you don't want to be part of the european arrest warrant whether you whether you want to completely say oh we're going to decide how many cod we're going to fish and sod the rest of you actually that's not the point the point is how do we arrive at decisions and involve people and i think that's still kind of what you're driving as well and that seems to me right at the heart of all the things that we believe in which is about finding ways to really get people involved in politics and political decision making um, that's kind of how I see it, and we're going to phrase it in different ways, and we're going to see things that um, and it's going to be emphasised in different ways. Um, I can't go out as things are in 2014, um, um, you know, saying saying to British public at large, you know, it's all going to be marvellous if we have. Um, greater integration based on the current EU, the, 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 how the structures are. I couldn't do that. I don't think, I think it would be right. And I don't think that really harmonizes with who we are. But then it's up to us to, uh, to offer a different vision. What I also don't want um, is for us to shut ourselves off in the United Kingdom. That would be a disaster. And um, I don't think that's what people want either. This is a very difficult debate, and I think none of you should underestimate how hard it is, and actually how hard a position to take this is. And the, um, because it's also trying, when um, everything has been phrased either with and the kind of way that Brussels wants to kind of 
control every part of your life. Or on the other side is that everything's marvellous and it's wonderful and the EU is making sure that also everything's fine for workers and it will be a disaster. Uh, we need to find a real, it's uh, the, 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 the place in between, which isn't easy politically. And I think also that's also what you're trying to do too. And I think we can, but it's not hard. It's not an easy, it's not an easy task. And I'm interested to hear from you guys also, also in terms of the German elections coming up, you know, what part that debate is going to play in the Bundestag elections, if at all. Well, well, I can give you a straight answer. I mean, you hold used to... On, hold on, please. Small moderation insert here. Um, Chaos Mobile, whoever you are, you are regularly um, clicking and sending noises. I'm so sorry. I'm off then. Thank you. What a pity. Well, you you know, see, uh, you talked about. Excuse me, I, I, I'm on the Wortmeldungsliste and you just start talking. Where's that Wortmeldungsliste, please? Right there, and I already dis deleted uh, Frank, but I can confirm that he's first now. Frank, Frank, Frank is on. Frank is on. Okay, I want to respond to uh, Loss. Um, Okay, um, I think there's a lot of common ground and um, I described that shortly, uh, common ground between private party UK and Germany regarding the objectives, how we want uh, to have this Europe, this Europe regarding uh, first uh, it should be really democratic and uh, there should be uh, citizen participation and I also think we are, have come ground that it should have some kind of flexibility. Um, I mean, it's really an easy question that um, if if we um, that one should ask the people how much power they want to have on which level, national, local, European level, on which topic of policy, and I don't think that. There's so substantial differences in these questions uh, between the different countries. There would be some differences, but not so m many. And maybe one could find a way, a solution, which uh, gives some flexibility here. But I suppose there's some quite some common ground if the basics are perceived by the population that the basics are right and basics mean that whatever this political European system is, it must be truly democratic and there must be truly the feeling that people can participate. And uh, the question we uh, I want to ask uh, is that the Pirate Party Germany has in its program formulated the idea of a common European constitution that is based on the, maybe it's based on the experience that Germany has had with its uh, constitution after the Second World War, where we had, it, this gave us really the chance to, to be become a democratic society, so it's a very positive thing for us, and so it's it's nearby to uh, say we want to bring this idea on a European level, and um, this wouldn't mean that all power would lie on the central level, it, it would just mean that it would be a security to gain really a dem democratic system, and the details could could uh, be adopted to what the people want. And my question is, um, I know that from the history, uh, Britain hasn't this, I don't think you have the same uh, experience with constitutions. You have unwritten constitutions as far as I, I understand it. And the question would be, um, could you adopt to such a system or how could that be formulated that it is attracted, attractive for you uh, that, or that your, uh, your, ex your historic experience with, with these issues uh, can be um, also be part of this, this idea? Good. Yes. I mean, in terms of uh, constitution, thinking about constitution, um, in a way it's uh, it's also splitting hairs slightly, but I mean, in one sense, we do have a, a constitution, actually, that also that far too much is written down. But 
But I think it's fair to say it's not coherent in the way that perhaps I think most countries would understand it now. Um, I, for one, would welcome um, a move in that direction. Um, I think one of the biggest, almost tactical mistakes that happened um, in terms of the EU constitution, as it was, and I think we may well remember also that being circulated, was even just to call it a constitution. This also opened up, I think, for a lot, for a very, a very easy argument for people not willing to look at the actual content and substance was that this makes countries weaker because it's a constitution. Only a country can have a constitution. Um, I think, uh, again, again, to me, that was a bit spurious. Um, but I think that's something we just need to take on board is also, again, just remembering why, also where that was rejected, um, and that it was, um, also again, in referendums. And so um, <laughs> I think we need to find a different word for it. But this is actually something that we're suggesting. I think it's at the heart of what we're trying to get, um, again, in not a very detailed way, and yet in the, Europe, in the PPUK manifesto. But it is that, um, is to say that at least we need to have a new agreement as to how this works. Um, and I don't think, I don't see why that shouldn't be a popular thing in, you know, right, right across um, 27, 28 countries. It's, again, I just emphasise again, it's not just the UK has, how has had questions. It just, I think it just happens to be for the first time, I think, particularly why Cameron raised uh, so much interest. Perhaps it was the first time there was the real prospect of a country leaving the EU. That's sort of what, I mean, I think that's kind of what it opened up. But equally, the opposite side of that is to say, um, what is how is it going to work um and i think that's what we're trying to do and i hope that others are trying to do too i'm aware this is a difficult and hugely complex area and you know we've got enough to deal with in terms of um you know oh, complex sure. policy it is but um we, i think we can start to offer that positive vision of what it should be and i'm really i'm really heart to see that that's what we're talking about now and that we see that, that also the differences between that and us well, are not that much. Well, I mean, you know, uh, people started talking about that much earlier than Cameron, right? You have UKIP, you know, with, uh, you know, Mike Nigel Farage, you know, talking about it much earlier than Cameron did for sort of public consumption. You know, it's, it's his rhetoric, you know, for public consumption. And, you know, there was a, a discussion into that matter, uh, spearheaded by Nigel Farage of UKIP, of course, and only Cameron only picked up on it. Understand? But I think there's a real distinction to be made because, again, the, uh, Nigel Farage's vision isn't just well, if, if one could call it that at all. It's it's not interesting to me. It's that what the the distinction to be made is to say, well. What is it that we want then? Um, and then, but also the question to me is, who is the we? And also, we need to find the way to share that across different countries. Obviously, if it's about saying we want to reform what the EU is about, and again, we've all been talking about this in different ways uh, this evening, um, then that's not just the job of any one country to come up with that that's the con that's the job of all of us and also what's you know i think the pirate party movement's well placed to do that because we do regularly talk to each other and we do think of ourselves as a we i think in a in a 
a different way to even um, to, to even other parties. You know, I I know, for example, if you think about the left, that also certain socialist parties think of themselves as being international. But I think we do really think of ourselves internationally. That's how we were born, and also in terms of the what we want to defend is a very different way of thinking and a way of connecting. So I think we can offer that. Um, and that way of thinking and what we um, and, and and to work at it positively because you know let's face it it's us here having this discussion um the british conservative party came up with a speech and went home again we're actually trying to have the discussion that's right and you know talk talking at this moment uh, the pirate party of australia is in fact has registered for national elections and i went on their irc channel today and uh, you know this this thing is a huge thing and there are universal values here though though i can't quite go along with what hamburg frank said about germany only having the chance for democracy after you know the second world war when the americans forced some particular system onto them. You know, in fact, the Weimar Republic of Germany, you know, the, the Weimar Constitution was a pretty good democratic constitution that was uh, written after the First World War. It was a great, you know, a huge breakthrough and a very valuable model. And definitely it was not the Americans who brought democracy to Germany. You know, it was the Weimar Constitution was very democratic, and it didn't take the Americans to force us upon Germany. Well, not at all. Um, I think we had something from Andy coming up about the Constitution. Yeah, I mean, uh, just really briefly, I think the laws touched on it. The phrase Constitution is worrying in the UK. If you look at the UK as a you know as a constitutional monarchy, with a constitution that is essentially based on parliamentary sovereignty. Um, anything that looks like a constitution beyond a normal treaty, you know, regardless of what it's called to a certain extent, um, we can't abridge that parliamentary sovereignty. So anything that is agreed by one parliament can theoretically be overturned by another. Um, and I think it's the phrasing that scares people. It's and that you know something we have to get around because we do need a framework to work together we we have lots of treaties and any new treaty whether it's framed as a constitution or not is essentially that it is a treaty that you know binds those who want to be part of it within the european union together um but it's not something that as a constitution implies is something so rock solid that it is the fundamental basis for um you know, for legislation across the entire um, the the countries involved, um, and I think that's a huge aspect. I don't think laws emphasised it enough. The the simple use of the term constitution in a European context is politically problematic in the UK, and it's I think it's as simple as that. If we talked about a treaty um, to you know harmonise values or to to describe the direction that the European Union is going to go or whatever else, it would be much less problematic. The moment it becomes a constitutional thing or the moment we start hearing the word federal thrown around then you start hitting problems and that's simply it's partially a media thing it's partially a a feeling i think a british identity thing but it's not about the content as such the title is ridiculously important as well and i think it's just worth pointing that out and underlining it because it's something that most people i think a large number of people in the uk who are interested in this kind of thing will have a view on I mean, um, do you get it right that you don't even have the debate whether or not you want a federation or a confederation or whatever it is? I mean, you just have the debate whether or not you want more integration at all. Uh, well, the debate currently is focused on leaving the EU rather than anything else. It's hopefully going to spur a debate about the level of and type of integration that we see within the UK. And the UK has sidestepped this. UKIP has run on a negative basis, uh, you know, as. Um, Pirate de Luc said, as it were, um, they've been talking about repatriating powers and European overreach and all that kind of stuff, but never really about what they want as an alternative for it. Hopefully this referendum will force that on us in the UK and with a bit of luck, because there are an awful lot of interested parties, um, from businesses through to political groups through to 
everything else who are going to have an interest in this. It may well be that we have a proper discussion, unlike with the alternative vote referendum, um, and more like with the Scottish independence referendum, there are a lot of interested parties on both sides, probably far more on the pro-EU side, who have a vested interest in making a case, and I think we are part of that. We have to make the case for Europe and what we see our future in that being, um, and of course the European elections for us will be, a, yeah, that's going to dominate the European elections for us. But this is going to be the first real chance to do that. Usually it causes such a rift in the two main political parties that it's simply ignored. Or it's used occasionally as leverage, it isn't entirely ignored. Um, you've talked about um, how um, the advanta advantages of, of the EU are not sufficiently explained and showcased and I think it's something we have all over the EU but is there is there any conscience at all about the this this opt out um, mania that the UK has shown I'm being I'm being playing the bad guy right now um, I don't know if there is even a single European treaty where the UK doesn't have um, an exemption of some kind um, I mean, from a con continental view, um, it's it's dragging their feet, and um, is is this is it something that is just being sh seen as being heroic and defending one's um, one's view, or is it um, is it is, is there any you know like b bad feeling, bad conscience about having not really played long till then till now? If I I don't know if Loz wants to jump in on this first. You know, I think, you know, Julian Pirate, Assange, Pirate, Pirate, Julian Pirate Assange Pirate. was apprehended. Um, Piradolix, I'm absolutely adamant you will not jump in on our guests. So this is Lawrence or Andy, and you, you're very welcome to put yourself into the list. Thank you. Sorry, um, sorry, Andy, you go ahead. I actually, I just need to send an email. I'll be with you. Yeah, sure. In that case, um, uh, Jack may well say something on this, but my view is it's quite simple. The UK, like we said, looks at this European aspect as a foreign policy issue. So going into negotiations, it's important to make sure and to appear to be protecting the UK's interests. Coming back with an opt-out is a wonderful trophy to a certain extent. It's a good way of dealing with the anti-European sentiment in the press. If you as a politician can go out and negotiate with the European Union and come back with an opt-out of some sort, then the focus will be on the opt-out rather than the rest of the treaty and the you know the UK law that will essentially come later. Um, so I think there's, there is a very, very large aspect of it being um, more about what it looks like than substance. I don't think that's always the case. Um, I think there are pragmatic reasons for some of these opt-outs some of the time. But it's the same with you know the rebate. It's a case of, look, we're getting something back. We have done something. We haven't let the European Union roll over us which sometimes is the public view. Um, I'm not sure that we could really see opt-outs in negotiated treaties as a bad thing. I think that's the point of negotiating, as long as the UK isn't going to try and get them for the sake of having one, which I'm hoping we haven't done, although, you know, it's arguable. Um, then again, if we're negotiating, we're negotiating fairly and we're doing it above board, then having opt-outs to aspects within the European treaties, which other countries do have, isn't necessarily a bad thing, although I'd like to see more agreement full stop so that we didn't need them. Um, I think one of the the other things is that, um, um, as we discussed earlier, is this uh, concept of parliamentary sovereignty, that um, obviously that is kind of what our uncodified constitution relies on is that parliament is sovereign and so a lot of this this time this when we're negotiating um treaties is that okay well parliament has the ability to decide so we'll negotiate opt-outs and opt-ins and therefore parliament will get kind of a token say over it uh, as a symbolic thing um as well as uh, what andy mentioned about having an opt-out as a trophy, it's also uh, an excuse to flex parliamentary sovereignty muscles, even when we don't really need to. Yeah, it makes it easier to get stuff through Parliament at the end of the day. It's a political measure as well. I think that might be what Jack is getting at. 
Okay, I think Pirata Lux is now the next. Yeah, uh, I, it took me a while to understand the queue system here, so that took me off a little bit. So, next speaker, please. Uh, all right. Um, then we have Alan. Alan? I'm oh, sorry, I forgot to press the button. Um, Europe will be a very different place in one year uh, from now. Um, the measures that will have to be taken to consolidate the Eurozone will be very far-reaching, and it won't be just the UK with big problems. It will be other countries as well in Europe, um, maybe not all 10 of the 27, um, but there will be a strong resistance from many countries, including Sweden, to having, for example, common debt. In other words, uh, all Spain's debt and all uh, his debt is uh, backed up by by the German taxpayer, and that is going to be very, very unpopular. That's why uh, Merkel has got to have the election done before all these things to, talked about, and uh, the referendum in Europe, uh, uh, in England about Europe is going to be in a couple of years and it will be a very very different case then uh, uh, than it is today so th I think it's uh, uh, totally the theoretical to talk about now what will going to be hap happen in a couple of years um, Paradolix had a nice uh, topic I would like to finish this one before we go on to his topic um, I'm going back to my question about um, um, you know, um, playing along, which is um, supposedly what a community is also about to me, and I'm um, not sure. I mean, from from your answer, I got the the idea that it's still very confrontational. I mean, when when it's being known that um, some new chapter is being written in uh, European integration, then the UK walks into it as into a confrontation where it has to come out. Um, somehow victorious, or at least with, with some good points to bring home. Did I get that correctly? I think that's a. F I think that's a fair view of how it's portrayed, and it's. Um, uh, and also, I think that's the kind of the question about um, where also the power really lies because um also the, the big confusion also in how the the eu functions overall um is that there's this tension between also negotiating chapters and suddenly um suddenly david cameron or whoever has to sort of uh you know just sweep in and also the everyday work and um, the everyday work of the um, of the, the European Parliament, the Commission, and the Council, and the rest of it. And again, that's why I can't have, we have to go back to saying this has to function better than it does now. Um, the the big question is about what it will take to. Um, to change the view of things, and I think this is, you know, at the end of the day, is why the the referendum may well be really important. I think it's as Andy said earlier, is that it's a real opportunity to finally have the discussion, which has been overdue. We have to face up to the fact that the European Union project has not brought the British people along with it, by and large. That is the reality. Um, so, um, to me, um, no, I, I, it's, I'm saddened by some of the, particularly the way that the way the debate has gone. I uh, say that I have to face up to that, and I think for all of us who are interested in participative democracy, we have to face up to that fact. So that's why the referendum is um, an opportunity. Now, I think it's um, still some discussion about whether it will happen. 
I think politically it is um, pretty much an inevitability now in the United Kingdom, despite the fact of uh, the Labour Party leader Ed Miliband saying that um, he didn't support it. I will be very surprised if they are going to fight the 2015 parliamentary election on that basis. I think that will be quite difficult for them because it could be that all of that general election will become about that, which will be a shame because we have a lot to talk about. Um, but this has to be the opportunity. And, um, and again, um, I, th I think it will be interesting to see um, I mean, if we're looking towards creating a new, also, also if we're offering a new vision of what the European institution should be about, of course that should be subject to a referendum. And I think that's what we should be trying to get towards. But also that should be the case for other countries too. And it's, I mean, I know with the Swedes is that, I mean, a lot of the the positions that we've ended up taking been similar to the of Pirot uh, in 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 Sweden. Um, so I think again that's something that that I think at least is worth adding into the discussions about um, for other for other um, EU pirate parties. Um, I know that we've taken a step back on PPEU as at the moment as the UK. That's as that is. But um, that I think it might be worth um, at least considering is um, for our, for the other EU parties to say, well, do we want to reshape this? I would argue that we would, and that would make sense in terms of our vision of democracy overall. But um, that's a long way from talking about why we have we. We pile into <laughs> why our politicians pile in in this rather annoying way, and I'm 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 sorry, um, you know. Um, although I don't feel responsible for them, it's it's just a bit embarrassing sometimes. So we're not all like that. <laughs> yeah, you sound a bit like an American. Well, I'm American, but don't hold it against me. Um, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, um, I'll take Andy up because he has a point about confrontation, and then Pirate Deluxe. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's just important to take into account that British politics is inherently confrontational. Um, on a local level, on a national level, it is the opposition versus the incumbent. And that is the way we frame an awful lot of stuff, and it's the way a lot of the discourse happens as well. You know, we're, we're in a unique position at the moment with a coalition government. It's certainly not the rule in UK politics that you will see coalitions between anybody. Um, so you have to take that into account to a certain extent. The politicians that we send to Europe, the politicians that are talking in the UK, get there to a certain extent by disagreeing with their opposition almost uniformly, by having a fight about whatever it is and ignoring the issues where they agree because it is about confrontation and it is about um, it is about beating the other guy. The voting system comes out of that. Even the arrangement of the, you know, of the commons, you've got two groups of people facing off um, across a room, which is very different from some European countries. So I think we need to take that into account and not, you know, don't take it personally. We do this at home as well. Yes, I think you have, uh, you have an history that's true. Uh, Pirate Deluxe, please. Merci, merci beaucoup, mon ami. Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, we earlier we've been talking about the referendum, right? And you know, people, some speakers in here, you know, some some you know, PPUK members, chill. Uh, some PPUK members talked about the referendum, uh, talking about the outcomes of some referendum, not even questioning the very process that led to that referendum. You know, frankly speaking, a referendum on uh, the EU treaty, like the Maastricht Treaty or something, is, is, is uh, you know, it's not a referendum in the Greek sense of the word. You know, look at Ireland, you know. They, they had a referendum. Germany did not have ever had a referendum. Germany was forced into the Western capitalist world by the United States back in 1944, uh, 45, uh, after the Second World War, Germany never had a referendum on the EU. 
the government, the fucking government of Germany, in fact, you know, forced Germany into the EU. While the, the uh, Irish did have it, the Greek, in fact, the inventors of democracy, tried to set up a refer referendum about whether or not you know, capitalist ideology would apply to modern day Goldman Sachs ripoff schemes, you know, totally for totally throwing Greeks under the bus. And that referendum was called off. You probably remember that. It's only a year ago. You don't have that kind of referendum if it's really risky or if it really in fact challenges the powers of democracy. So, you know, the heck, you know, what you talk about referendum? When the Irish said no, they were asked again until they said yes, and that was the final referendum. Whereas, you know, if you and, and if the referendum turns out saying, you know, no way, you know, you're being asked again. So, I mean, what the heck is your referendum? You know, this is a, this is a freaking manipulation. You see it in Greece, you see it in Ireland. So, I mean, how dare you talk about a referendum? You know, it, it's a travesty. It's not a referendum, it's a travesty of democracy. Oh, um, well, mm, none of that makes very much sense to me. Um, all I can say is that I can't imagine going into 2014, I want to just have to think about this practically. Um, uh, I can't imagine that practically going into the European uh, elections in 2014 um, with the Conservative Party offering a referendum, imperfect as it is, I take that, um, I, I see that um, no, no, it was very far from perfect. It's very, as I've said throughout this evening, um, there are a lot of very fundamental, dif fundamental problems with British democracy, uh, which go way deeper than our relation to the EU. Nevertheless, I couldn't imagine going into the um, into the twenty fourteen elections with the Conservatives offering a choice um, on. Um, as essentially on our relationship to the EU and the Pirate Party saying no, we wouldn't support that. To me that was, it would be an untenable position and would be also that would be a travesty. That wouldn't um, that wouldn't uh, also I think it would completely undermine our position uh, in terms of um, I think in terms of ordinary voters. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think it's completely right. I think there's. A, I think it's very interesting to talk about um, talking about the uh, where frustration to do with the EU has come from. I think it's very right to say that um, this, uh, that both for Denmark, it's often expressed that um, well, you didn't get it right for the first time, so you vote again, um, and for Ireland as well. But I maintain with Denmark is that what happened there is that they put the case, um, particularly, I mean, uh, um, particularly, for example, uh, the Socialist Volker Party, who, after all, we sit together with, that uh, Christian and um, Amelia sit together with in the Green Group, sit together with the Socialist Volker Party from, um, from Denmark, they changed their view because actually they achieved what they wanted in relation to the EU. So, um, to me, uh, that makes complete sense, is that for them, they decided what they thought was right, and then what they thought was the right, the right uh, decision to make. And when they actually were happy, they changed their minds, which is also positive too. And, you know, uh, it's a long way. Um, am I happy with a, with the rev with how things have happened with referendums that we've had recently in the United Kingdom? No. But one of the things that's changed hugely is that um, it's often said about the United Kingdom is that we're not Switzerland. We don't have these kinds of consultations. Um, that's actually no longer true. 
Um, where I live in Manchester, we've actually had three referendums within the last five years, one on tra transport, one on whether we, we should elect our mayor directly, and one on the, uh, the alternative vote. Um, so we're actually getting used to it. Um, but I share the concern about the reality of um, imposed economic situations. I share the concern about uh, democratic participation. But no one thing will fix this. A, a new European constitution won't fix it. A new voting system won't fix it. It's as fundamental as actually making, uh, making uh, actually offering up the possibility that people can really get involved and really have a voice and really make a difference. I live uh, closest to some of the poorest areas in the United Kingdom and actually some of the poorest areas in entire Western Europe. Um, that the, the, the problems are so multiple and there are also the people that really are the victims of some of the economic situations which have been discovered and uh, discussed earlier, but also that um, you know uh, referendums, liquid feedback, all the rest of it won't immediately change their situation. We have a big job to involve them, and um, I think we can do that. I don't promise that it's going to happen easily. I don't think any of us out there working for the Pirate Party in our different countries, in our different ways, say that that's going to change overnight. Um, and we know how hard it is. And we've chosen the hardest route. It's easy to campaign on one issue. But we've talked about a range of things. That's, um, but that's our job. And to me, that's what we can do and start to offer. And we can offer it on the big level for an entire continent. Um, but to me, what we have to offer on the entire continent has to be based on the principle of what we want to offer on the, on the street we live on. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, I think Frank is next. Yes, I have one question in the Europe Working Group, um, which is organizing this Mumbles. Mumble, we discuss um, many different uh, issues, how Europe can become uh, more democratic. And one idea was on the European level to put next, one thing obvious is to get uh, the European Parliament more democratic and uh, give it more power uh, regarding uh, the power to initiate laws by themselves they haven't they have not this this right at the moment but uh, another idea regarding um, people participation was um, the idea to set next to the European Parliament as a parliament of of elected representatives uh, to put a second chamber uh, we called it citizen chamber um, so there would be a possibility for people to uh, participate more directly. Maybe uh, it's not it's not clear cut. It's only an idea. Maybe also using liquid democracy uh, tools. And um, I would like to know if if that's something you find attractive or helpful. Well, in terms of democratization, yes. In terms of being able to introduce laws, I'd agree as well. Um, as long as there is a sensible framework within which people are working, so we don't end up with the kind of overstretch that the UK talks about, but doesn't generally happen as badly as it seems. On liquid feedback, um, the UK party doesn't use it, and I'd just like you to be aware that I'm sat next to a stack of 30 odd letters from various people who've written to the party and that where laws stands you've got a whole demographic that have no access to the internet or very limited access to the internet where you're talking about 30 percent regular access to the net that's not a good thing 
and that obviously has a disproportionate impact on people who are the poorest, who are currently looking at their economic situation and deciding that the one thing they can get rid of is an internet connection. Um, democratization is important. How we do that has to work across Europe. And I think given the differences in opinion as to what democracy actually means and how we should have it within Europe, I don't quite know how we're going to come to a consensus, but Jack might have a better idea. Only that it's a, a very hard problem. <laughs> Sorry, we Sorry. talked liquid feedback before. I thought you might have something. Sorry. Yeah. Um, in terms of liquid feedback, obviously, uh, yeah, I think that participation rates, having people who can participate, is is obviously a hard problem. But um, picking something else up about citizen part participation, obviously, at the moment we have like um, the European Citizens Initiative which is set up to make it as difficult as possible to actually do anything. Um, like the, the whole audit requirements on the system, if you're going to set up a, you know, an online signature collection, the whole audit system, um, the hoops you have to jump through for sort of uh, having not only getting the million signatures, but also getting a certain number from each member state. Um, making um, mechanisms like that easier to use, easier to set up, making it so that um, something is just easy for the average citizen to use would be probably a better place to start at getting more citizen participation and then branching out from there. And of course, on the issues of um, the parliament, I, I agree with what. what you said on the European Citizen Initiative, um, yeah, it's had a very bad start. Um, I'll just say in defense of the, of the Commission that they are actually working on it. Um, one of the effects is um, that they, um, well, their software that they provide is so crappy that um, so many people had difficulties setting it up, but they're now providing the web space with um, the um, um, the formulas, you know, with with the whole system, to to uh, so if you register an ECI, you can actually use their their system. But it's still it's still crappy. It's still there are still some bugs and it's not working well. But at least they're they're, they're working on it. Um, a question. Um, I mean, and, and unless somebody has something on on, on this. Um, democracy topic. I wanted to go back to what brought us together tonight, which is which was Cameron's speech, and I'm not sure. Maybe I've just missed it because I had to to be away for some time. But um, did we actually talk about the speech in itself and how it was received? I mean, in in the UK, the, what what were the echoes? Did, was it a plus for him? Didn't did did it, did it catch? Um, what 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 were the um, how did, it work out? How did it work out for him? Well, this it was interesting because it was also such a long, big build-up to it, and it was flagged as very significant. Um, uh, if the aim was to also solve some of the the difficulties within his own party, also particularly because of the perceived threat. Um, real or otherwise for the UK Independence Party, it hasn't entirely worked out um, how they might have hoped. You just have to look at the opinion polls. However, I think um, what has been clear is that I think a lot of people have basically said, um, well, it's actually it's not surprising that, that this is the kind of direction that we are going, that that I think for a long time a lot of commentators have been saying um, a referendum is going to happen. And also it's worth pointing out that that's not just from the right, it's also from commentators on the left as well, um, although the, the Labour Party hasn't really caught up with that. Um, I... I think what's I think what's quite interesting if you kind of read the whole thing is actually how much he felt it necessary or his speechwriters felt it necessary to talk about history 
Um, and I think for, um, I'd be interested to see how other people that, um, uh, you know, from other countries perceived that. Um, it's the sort of thing that goes down very well here, and it hit all the kind of references that people like to hear about. Um, that, but possibly other people find rather annoying, frankly. I think the real point is also, well, what is it that we want and what do we want to do now? Um, and uh, it, it still provided a, a balancing act between, well, we still want to be in this, but it's time to make a, make a, 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 a decision. I think how it was interpreted was that um, essentially it was about, um, in a way, offering up an ultimatum to say that this is our kind of negotiating tool and that somehow that consulting the people was about in fact, a kind of offering some kind of threat. I don't see that as very productive and I... Uh, and I think we need to think about, again, as we've all been talking about democratic participation, I think we need to be much more mature about it than that. Um, but I think in lots of ways that's how it was interpreted. Um, so for the, um, for the Labour Party in, the Brit in Britain, uh, they chose to focus on saying it was a weak statement because for him it was about trying to please the party. But nevertheless, it still does um, ask the fundamental question, which I think is very, I think it is worth asking for all of us, which is to say, fundamentally, is this the right thing to be doing? Could we be doing this better in the right way? I'll just repeat my view, which is that I think it's wrong-headed to talk about specific issues, to say actually the negotiation is about saying oh, we want, uh, you know, we want to remove ourselves from these chapters. I think that's, that's, uh, that's about just a small thinking politically. I think it's, again, it's what we want to emphasize. It's about reforming how the how the entire institution functions um and and that's also how we're going to get a different result on for example the common agricultural policy because at the moment there is no prospect of that changing even though this has been talked about in a variety of countries for some years so um uh, but it's certainly said in terms of internally in the United Kingdom, it doesn't solve all of the Conservatives' problems. Um, but it goes some way towards us all confronting a real question, which is um, asking fundamentally what is our vision um, for the EU going forward. Can I sum it briefly? Bonds. Essentially, in terms of opinion, there was very little shift towards Cameron. Within the party, it was expected, even outside of the party, a referendum was expected anyway. So it's essentially a solidification of what we expected. I don't think it's done him any huge favours or any large amount of damage either. Not calling it would have caused. But not calling it would have caused more damage, as my other half just shouted across the room. <laughs> in terms of um, polling, um, in the days after the speech, actually, Cameron and the Conservatives poll rating went up by about 5%, but that has already dropped back down now, um, whether that's to do with other internal things within British politics, you know, there's some effect, other effects there. But there was, a, there was a bump toward Cameron and the Conservatives, which has disappeared now. So... Obviously, it has been seen, I guess, as something as a a, a bit of a, something to placate his own people and his traditional electorate, rather than something to drag the rest of the UK along with him. I mean, I think that's exactly why we're emphasising that there is a missed opportunity in this. 
which is um, because it can't just be about um, the internal squabbles of a British politics, which no doubt aren't also when you <laughs> get outside this country, perhaps aren't that interesting, really. Um, but the heart of it is, again, something which and I'll just reiterate is important for us all. Um, and I think also, but I think we're actually, I, I, why I'm actually pleased about the position that we've taken as a party and that, that, that we've arrived at together collectively offers something unique in British politics. Um, to a certain extent, the Green Party has said similar things, but they actually haven't bothered to articulate it. Um, it's to say, so we've been saying, yes, absolutely, let's vote on it, let's have a, let's take this debate, but also actually say, what is it that we want, and how can we get other people to agree? Because surely from any walk of life, in anything else that you want to do, to say, you know that you will not get what you want by antagonising people. <laughs> and that is what the Conservative Party are brilliant at doing. Um, even if they, even if they're trying to suggest something that which is useful, they manage to do it in a way which annoys everyone. <laughs> um, I'll, yeah, definitely. Um, we have a question in in the pad. I'll just read it out because it's someone that can talk, obviously. Um, can you make some suggestions what you personally or as a PPUK member think the EU can do to be more attractive to the UK? Um, not only financially, perhaps. Was that clear? I think I can answer it if no one else wants to jump. Well, go ahead. I don't think the EU can do an awful lot at all to make itself attractive to the UK. I think the argument has to come from within the UK. Um, like I said, there is still an attitude, of, the, you know, the attitudes that we discussed earlier on. Um, are prevalent. So the case for EU membership, the case for the EU, the, the case for further integration and the continuation of the project has to come from British politicians, um, anybody interested really within the UK discussion, shall we say, uh, rather than from outside of the EU as such. In terms of making it more um, attractive as an organisation, we have the democratic reforms that we've already talked around about although we need to define exactly what they are. Um, and the second thing might be about dealing with the, the misinformation and the information that we see from the press. But again, I don't think the EU putting that out there is going to help very much. Um, I mean, if you look at the, the videos that, the, that we see occasionally, they tend to get laughed at to a certain degree rather than being seen as a positive. Um, it has to be substantial change, I think. Um, in terms of democratization and in terms of making sure that decisions are made at the relevant level um, and that we don't have this whole corrupt aspect or the appearance of corruption in terms of the gravy train Brussels. If we could do something to eliminate that, that would make most people in, your, in the UK quite happy. I don't know if that last bit is actually beneficial to the EU um, as a whole, because the remuneration of politicians, as much as people like to vilify it, isn't something that really needs to be cut back to a point where everybody's starving and in poverty, because that doesn't help either, and it makes it harder for people to get involved. Yeah, I don't quite buy the, the um, uh, EU costs too much argument, because if you look at the numbers, you notice that it's Compared to national um, administrations, it's actually a fairly cheap and, and s slender administration. Abs uh, absolutely. I think um, yeah, it's not just the MPs, but I think there's a perception issue there. And it's a, ca it's a case that has to be made within the UK. Uh, I think, seriously, the point here is we have to make the case within the UK. Um, and we have to get some of this misinformation dealt with and push out those positives, especially on regulation, especially on access and, and all the rest of it. I mean, open borders, movement of people, movement of goods. That's the case that has to be made. Yeah, there are changes that have to be made to the EU, but they're going to take a lot longer anyway. Um, and maybe there is even an argument to say that we point out the issues and say we have to be part of it to fix it. 
yeah, in support of that argument, I, um, I can show you if I, if I find it, uh, the, the newest Eurobarometer, um, where it's quite clear from that, um, as soon as uh, public opinion, uh, thinks that you cost not so much anymore as, as expected or as, as perceived, um, the, the uh, affirmation or the, the, um, uh, positive attitude towards the EU starts to go up. Good. So that's yeah. Su yeah, that's su support that argument. So public opinion and, and the manipulation of public opinion is, uh, is a quite important issue in that respect. We will have to deal with the fact that the UK does have a net trade deficit with the European Union and is a net contributor. But I think both of those things can be seen from the benefits that Loz talked about with European Development Funding and all that kind of stuff as well. But it's about getting the message right within the UK. Within the UK. Sorry, Loz, I cut you off there, I think. No, that's fine. Um, again, I think we have to be better at making say, what is it? Um, one of the, 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 again, the arguments constantly coming back to say, will we spend this? And say, well, what is that we receive? It will help if also that we can um, demonstrate that that's being spent in the right way. But obviously it's making a huge contribution to, um, to uh, back to us. It's not like it's all money that disappears away and that's always how it's portrayed. If the other big battle that we need to do in the United Kingdom is also to t tackle head on also things which is a which is a uh, a, a right wing populist argument which is to do with that immigration the, the most recent way it's been framed is about the idea that lots of people are going to come from Bulgaria and Romania um it's it's very distressing, really, because actually, I mean, um, I mean, as far as I see it, I think it's it's a racist argument, and it it's that's what's um, being that's the attitude which is dressed up as being concerned about British citizens, but actually, um, that's the thing that we need to show how also about movement of people is that it goes both ways and um, if we completely cut ourselves out well there are hundreds of thousands of uh, British citizens which are currently leaving, are living within the EU what will happen to them um, I know for a certain part of my life I've been one of those people uh, so um, we have we have to stop that's it's a difficult case to frame because it's kind of feels like swimming against the tide, but we have to be saying, well, if we expect to be able to take part in um, in the international community, that has to go both ways. Um, and I think that's also what has not changed things to say that's what that's what this offers. We cannot guarantee outside the EU that it will be the same. That's that's also the whole point of the EU. We have... Okay. Yeah, sorry. Hello? Uh, Alan's next, I think. <laughs> okay. Noah ganz kurz dazu. Uh, just shortly to that. Uh, Lawrence, it's not fair to call these worries racist. I mean, it is technically possible that five, six, seven million Romanians and Bulgarians all come to England in one go and claim benefits. It's technically possible. I'm not saying it'll happen, but there is something wrong with the regulation that anyone uh, can uh, get benefits uh, having lived uh, somewhere for three days. It, it's a difficult problem and you can't uh, uh, just put away people's worries and anxieties, which are technically possible, just as racist. That's not fair. Well, uh, but also that... <laughs> But also that's why it's vital that those concerns are not framed in that way, because actually the whole rhetoric around it, as I'm not saying I'm not um, interested in those issues, and, but what I'm saying is that 
actually what stops solving concrete problems is the entire rhetoric around it. Um, we see how it's been framed in the British press. Um, consistently, uh, going back into all the way that also, for example, Polish migration has been characterised in the uh, United Kingdom. It was one of the, actually one of the things that came up in the Leveson inquiry was that also essentially time after time after time um, things which were not true were spread which are actually in, in terms of um, in terms of ridiculous things about about poles killing swans to eat them and you know all these extra um, which also not were just not true, but also actually actually come from an ideology of sort of they are different from us. They do things which are transgressive in terms of our culture. You know that to me is about where it's about something which is deeper than just being saying, well, okay, well, actually, we just need to look at how um, our benefit system works. Again, looking on the opposite on the opposite direction. I know again speaking from personal experience is that going the other way, it's not that easy. Um, again, because I lived in Denmark for seven years, it was not the case that immediately I rocked up in Denmark and that I could get a whole bunch of benefits, which of course are infinitely, um, no, infinitely is the wrong word, are uh, significantly <laughs> much better than the United Kingdom. I mean, you know, that's, I mean, that's the stupid thing about a lot of this argument, to say if you were just picking a country, you wouldn't pick the United Kingdom to come to get for benefits, and increasingly less so. Uh, um, so that, uh, that's uh, that's thing, but of of course uh, we have to look about how how these how movement people is is framed. But that's we can do we can only do that within a kind of common framework. We have again going back to we have to work together. We have to talk to each other. The British press are absolutely disgusting. I agree with you that hundred percent. Um, we have another question from the pad. Um. Are the people of PPUK discussing the possible scenario that if um, Great Britain leaves the EU, Scotland will have one more reason to leave the UK to join the EU as a country? Well, on that, of course, it's a matter for uh, the people of Scotland to decide. In, of course, obviously, they also have a referendum coming up. And in terms of independence, however, exactly that's framed. And again, that's of course it's for the people of Scotland to decide. Um, that <laughs> uh, yes, it's interesting. I uh, there's something which has become was also muddied to that debate, which is about whether um, that Scotland would, in the event of. Uh, a yes to independence, to full independence for Scotland, they would be negotiating with the EU within the EU or as an, as an entirely um, from outside. Um, and that's actually been a controversy in terms of Scottish politics. It's difficult for the EU because in that it creates interesting precedent because it's not obviously not just a question for for our country at the moment, uh, that's going to be significant in in terms of Spain, Catalonia, and the rest of it. This, it's not again, it's not just Britain that's facing that those issues. Um, again, uh, you'll it's it's up to the Scots to make that decision. Um, but I think it's very interesting to reflect that uh, that Britain is a very difficult state. We're in a difficult stage in our history right now um, because our country could look potentially utterly different by the time that we get to 2017. Could, we could be, uh, we could be sp uh, split up. <laughs> yeah, there could be, um, Scotland could be independent and we could be out of the EU, um, which would Oh, yeah, that's, um, the only thing that we can count on um, is uncertainty <laughs> in this life. Um, but uh, 
obviously uh, the decision if Scotland left that also opens up a lot of very difficult issues for us as a country because where does that leave Northern Ireland and we can see that there's after we've had um, a period of uh, relative peace in Northern Ireland um, there are also current difficulties there so it's um, you know, it's it's very easy to take peace and stability for granted, um, but we ne ne needn't necessarily do so. Um, but at the moment, you only have one pirate party for the UK, or do you have also a Scott pirate party? There's um, there's only one pirate party for Great Britain. Um, we don't have a presence in Northern Ireland because the legal situation. Uh, basically require us to have a, a separate party there um, but there is no separate pa uh, pirate party for um, England, Scotland and, and Wales with just one, one pirate party. Alright, um, I don't see any more questions or people requesting um, to talk in the pad. Do we have someone? That being not the case, my question would be to our UK guests, do you have any questions about um, the German Pirate Party, how we do things, how we th see things, any, uh, any topic you would like to hear about from us? I have one um, regarding essentially campaigning um, at the European level. I it would be good to um, get involved with whoever it is or whatever groups are going to be dealing with campaigns at the European level and also interchange some stuff at the, at the local level. So I wondered if you're doing that with any of the other European parties at the moment outside of the PPEU framework, which sort of doesn't exist at the moment. That would have been my, 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 my answer. Um, I have only personally followed the whole PPEU thing from a distance. Um, and just got as a feedback that it was not working really. Um, but um, the EU14 deadline is um, still a bit far away from for us. We're uh, at the moment only talking about um, how will we um, manage to get a list together for for this election. It's 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 a big challenge because um, it's going to be one list for the whole country, and we expect. Um, hundreds of of applicants, which makes it very difficult to held um, to hold e elections to just to be on the list. So we are um, talking about those difficulties at the moment. We're not yet talking about the campaigning. Um, I think there are some um, consultations or cooperations or uh, upcoming cooperations between the Eastern German pirates and Polish and uh, pirates from the Czech Republic. Um, but I'm not sure how far how far these uh, these efforts have gone so far. Well, I suppose then we need to talk at some point about how we cooperate practically um, as you guys get closer to being able to campaign and as we ramp up the stuff that we're doing now in terms of campaign. Well, what we are doing in terms of getting the the narrative out there and then the campaign as it kicks off. Um, do you have any? I mean, do you intend? I don't know if you can even answer this, but do you intend to? organize your campaign centrally or to do it on a more regional basis since you'll be standing a national list? Yeah, it's going to be a national list, so it should be a national strategy. Okay, excellent. Well, that makes it simpler, I assume. It's, yeah, it centralizes everything, so I hope it will be um, more manageable once we have the list together. That's going to be the big, the, the big part. Um, but um, if we could get back to the topic of PPEU uh, for a minute, because I just followed this for a from a distance, as I said, and um, can you, I don't know, give your perspective of on, on what happened so far and why it's not working? Jack, do you want me to do this or would you like to? Um, if you kick it up, I can come in after this. Yeah, it was basically, I mean, looking at PPEU for a, for a while, Jack dealt with it. Our international coordinator, Ed, was looking at it as well. And one of the things that became abundantly clear was that there was really no um, indication as to 
when we would have an end product and, and what that end product would be useful for. Um, for us, participating within PPEU was taking a few people's time up that could have been spent better on actually dealing with the real issues that we're dealing with day to day. So it was a resource problem to a large degree. Um, I guess there was this, the, the administrator element, this uh, aim to sort out large administrative issues that seemed premature for a cooperative organization. Um, I think possibly, I mean, my view personally, was certainly that the approach felt like it was going the wrong way around. Um, people were getting together and, and, and building structures and empires before anything practical was likely to happen. And then looking at the realistic prospects for the PPEU as a party uh, moving forward was also problematic. So that's, that's where it came to from us the notion of possibly it wasn't going in the direction that made a lot of sense for us and that it was going to take resources to build something that at the end of the day might be quite problematic. Um, and essentially, you know, in terms of our priorities, we're looking for the European elections for campaign support, for working together with European parties in a practical and real kind of you know immediate way without a huge administrative burden if we can avoid it. After all, most of us are fairly small parties or small groupings within parties that like to be nimble. It's one of our advantages. Um, uh, possibly also the aims of PPEU as described and as intended weren't entirely the same as what our perceptions were likely to be. So the end result in any case was that in terms of resources it didn't seem worthwhile for us. But we have significantly less resources than you guys did. Yeah, one of the um, one of the things that kind of uh, well frustrated me and us was um, that things were going very slowly. We were going in much more of a sort of theoretical basis and trying to set up too much structure and. Um, Things like um, having a court of arbitration and things like that, which didn't really seem to be what we need to do to organise on a European level. I think a lot of people in the beginning, what the vision was and the process we used to get to it, sort of... Uh, one or two people from various parties and some parties being overrepresented kind of led us into making a lot of the same mistakes and trying to do the same thing as PPI. So it was kind of being a bit of PPI on a, an EU level or European level when really um, PPEU for me and for the UK party should have been more um, what we can do to help each other campaign on a, a European level. I would also just add one thing to what Jack was saying, which is that there, from my participation at the one conference, plus the stuff that Jack made me read, um, there was a level of democratic deficit that frankly could have been quite damaging and I think could still be damaging to parties involved if you actually look at what was going on, um, which really isn't something that we as a pirate movement should be, um, well, it's something we should aspire to do much better, shall we say. So if I understand you correctly, you would favor a more informal get together, a more informal cooperation. I think we've got a lot of people who are doing similar jobs across Europe in terms of campaigns, in terms of media. Let's get those guys together. I mean, you know, this is kind of what we're supposed to be about. Some loose groups that form when a need when a need appears. And having something so that people know who to get in contact with is probably sufficient. And we'll build relationships that way. And it's much, much easier to work on the basis of having some shared experiences, some shared relationships, shared resources and all the rest of it. And if we do need a formal structure, well, we can do that out of what grows already. So to a certain extent, you'll end up with something that's actually functional because it's functioning as you as you build around it rather than trying to build something huge and slot people into it. Then if we get as far as the question about what happens if um, 
in term, uh, looking beyond 2014 and there's potential there's um, more than one country has a pirate party representatives in the European Parliament of course that's an entirely different situation and also that's something we need to look about in terms of groupings and the rest of it but it seems actually frankly premature at the moment and um, although we're a long way from that if we're just honest about it um, so there was a lot of certain amount of discussion about that. Um, I think uh, we need to uh, make sure that we do the work that gets us to that place first, otherwise we're not going to get there and we'll have done the wrong thing first. Alan, you would like to comment something? Ich schreibe gerade, ich kann das auch Who sagen. Has, uh, I wanted to comment. Um, somebody has deleted me from the word list. Oh, sorry, Frank, then go ahead. Okay, thanks. Yes, I want to respond. Uh, I, I um, agree with, with you, the last three uh, comments uh, to 100%. Um, and I think it's it's really everything is right um, there was too much uh, structure and um, I didn't exp I, I had also the impression that it wasn't uh, wasn't democratic or not it didn't uh, meet our standards uh, in the EU uh, European Pirate Party because from my understanding uh, we shouldn't work with that delegations level uh, when we have a European private party at some stage every pirate in Europe should have the same voting right and everything else is isn't the standard and I really think uh, we should uh, in the first place um, have uh, an information an informal uh, network just talking together and um, would uh, encourage to do this. Thanks. Yeah, that was one of the things that kept coming up over and over and over again was um, the nature of the organization in general, whether there would be, uh, whether it would be an organization of pirate parties or of pirates. And uh, every time we thought a decision was made down the road a little bit it would crop up again and um, I think this is one of the reasons why the, the process hasn't been going very well is that a group of people would come together the consensus would form it would move on a little bit and then other people would come in and would have the discussion over again and people would leave um, but yeah this is a problem that is, I don't think anybody has has solved, and with so many different pirate parties involved, I don't think it's going to be an easy problem to solve in the short term, at least not before the European elections, which is we need some sort of form of coordination for, and so definitely an informal um, sort of network of pirates that are involved in the European campaigns is something that is going to be very helpful for 2014. I'm very sorry to jump in. Um, I am Ed. I do international coordination. If you don't mind, uh, may I speak? Uh, first, there was Alan, and then there was a question by Alexandra. So it's not immediately on the on the uh, uh, topic just discussed. Uh, I would like you to um, to wait for for a second or two. Would that be okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, Alan has deleted his comment, all right. <laughs> ich habe es nicht weggewischt, hat jemand anders gemacht. Okay, Somebody so else uh, erased it. Yeah, sorry, it was me because I thought it was not a question. So um, if you want to say something, just go ahead. All right, I just wanted to say that what um, Lawrence said about the um, PPEU, it's very typical German to want to decide all possible structures, as it were, to have a constitution, 
and then start doing practical work, uh, the British are much more pr pragmatic. They start doing pragmatical work on problems that are, uh, like we were talking about, uh, uh, bank regulation or something, and uh, build relationships, and then decide on what possible structures we could have uh, to coordinate. And I think the pragmatic way of doing things is, is far more sensible. Yeah, especially for pirates. Um, then the question by Alexandra. Well, do you... Can't you speak? Somebody put question on line 17. All right, Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. It's Hi. Your yeah. Go ahead. A practical suggestion, why don't we meet um, like here in Mumble for once in a month or something to start with something? Good idea. Yeah, Los, Andy, Jack. Yeah, I I agree. I think it's um I think it might be sensible to get some contact details around people and just start talking, frankly, um, and then get in here every month or so, um, or whatever seems like a practical timetable, um, because it's likely to change. Yeah, absolutely. I do agree. We should. Um... I think we can we can do that via via uh, Thomas or so. He contact already lost, so maybe that would be a feasible option. Yeah, and um, well, La Lawrence, you have my Twitter account now. Anyways, um, you know where we f you can find us. Um, if you want to contact, you can get me. You can get the mailing list. Oh, can... sorry, I just missed the last part of that. Sorry, as I just said. Um, you, you know where to find us, <laughs> basically. You got me on Twitter. You get. Um, I can give you all the contacts um, of the um, of the working group. And um, um, I don't know if um, anyone here want to. Do you have like a to do something you want to to talk about? In ways so which would make it worth it deciding on. Um, on a you know on a time and place to meet right now. Um, possibly not right now, but I I think I think it's very positive. The idea of this that we we are just um, starting to form these connections and then actually we move forward on some of these i, I ideas. Um, yeah, well, let's keep in contact and and absolutely. Uh, meet up again. Uh, I will be glad to, and I think if I'm not intruding, I'll just use that as a very nice finish for the official part of the evening. You are intruding. Sorry. Oh, that. sorry. <laughs> um, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, I need. I think Ed wanted to say yeah. something. Please, Ed, go ahead. Yes. Hello guys, um, I'm really sorry I've ended up here as late as I have, unfortunately I was kept behind by work. Um, I do international kind of coordination stuff for the UK and I had meant to be here. Um, all I can kind of do is iterate some of the points that I've heard and point out that the informal structure that we've had has worked very very well for the UK. Uh, part of the problem we've had was in PPU was the formalization which has been brought up before um, and I'm, I'm kind of hoping that we can continue with the almost informal uh, formal kind of um, cooperation as we've had before that's pretty much it all right thanks uh, Frank the last one maybe okay I, might I want thanks I want to um, say that um, I would not recommend to formalize it now. Uh, there was a s suggestion to meet every month. Uh, I wouldn't do that. Uh, I think it's better to really to see uh, when topics come up and then to to discuss it. 
Um, and the the second issue is that obviously it doesn't make sense only to communicate between Britain and and Germany. It's an issue where all 27 countries are related. So um, it can be that maybe it's a good idea. Maybe, for instance, the the, the topic regarding uh, financial regulation that some some people say let's let's um, organize a mumble uh, european wide and there are few people who who invite the different in the different private parties or so i would really also recommend to to be very informal but just have it in mind that it makes sense and uh, to gain experience Um, I'll mention that, um, who is it? Um, Andy is adding some contact details, um, of PPUK at the bottom of the pad. So, anyone interested to connect, uh, in connecting, just grab, grab the contact details he's providing. And then I would like um, Lawrence to uh, say some final words. Well, um, I will thank you all also for the invitation this evening. I think that's a very uh, positive step forward. And, and when I, again, I think it shows the value of informal contacts. Uh, we've, ga uh, we've covered a lot of ground today. But for me, um, I think it's a it's a very positive initiative of, I think, turning round. Um, I think I think the attitude to the United Kingdom, I think, from, perhaps from from the rest of the EU, is perhaps has been some kind of puzzlement and indeed worry. I think, particularly on the back of David Cameron's speech, but also to say now. Um, the other side of it is that we do have an opportunity to think about um, everything that we've discussed this evening, which is also reframing a more participatory, a more democratic, a more open EU. We mustn't con confuse the idea of being internationalist, of wanting to cooperate with, that it has to be within a certain framework. Whether that's in the Pirate Party movement or in the EU as a whole. So I think that we can absolutely be asking those questions um, about how this is going to function in the future uh, and also bring that into elections and be asking that because to me that hangs together with the kind of politics that we stand for, which is about openness, transparency and participation and that we can capture back from some of the very worrying forces in our continent right now and why I brought up some of the kind of uh, the worrying um, arguments and uh, frankly attacks on foreigners and that we've seen in the, U the United Kingdom um, that this is happening right across our continent and that if we it's up to us to to offer something different that criticizing how and, and how an institution functions is not the same as also being the same as Nigel Farage or um, the, uh, the Danish People's Party or whoever it might be. But we have something really positive to offer and I think very particular to offer in the upcoming European election. We know that we have a unique agenda about digital rights and civil liberties but also I think we have an opportunity to say also that we can start to set the running on some really big issues and the big issues that people really care about we've talked about finance we've talked about um, we've talked about the euro we've talked about foreign policy and that we can we can set these things too I'm not saying that's going to be easy but at least this is a start of doing that and I've very much enjoyed today because it's just been really interesting and hearing people's views has been fascinating and also perhaps a chance to explain where we are in the United Kingdom as well without, you know, for once 
um, seeming to just demand things, but actually just wanting to open up a dialogue. That's the end of the day, all that we can do. Thank you very much for the opportunity for doing that. Well, you're very welcome. Sorry for the background noise. Um, I'd like to thank you and all the other UK guests we had tonight. I'd also like to thank, in absentia, Thomas, who did all the um, connecting and got you all down here in the night. That's very nice of him. Thanks, uh, Flo, for um, helping out uh, with the moderation. And um, I'm now closing the official part of the evening. Um, Flo, you can stop recording and we'll um, open the what we call the uh, mellow uh, part of the evening which is just unmoderated and talk um, thank you everyone yes thanks for me as well it's uh, now 10 minutes past 11 so we had a talk of about three hours quite good and I stopped the recording and uh, opening up the gossip around thanks a lot again <laughs>